I know you get the question a lot, but I'm genuinely curious. Fuego, you want me to, to, to respond why I don't believe in Jesus? It's, uh, just wait till someone comes up and asks me the question. Or see if you could come up if you have enough people. Guys, yeah, like the show, like the show, share, follow. Um, yeah, all the haters. Share to the haters first. Fuego, okay. Fuego. Dímelo cantando. ¿Está en español? Okay, so well, let's break down belief in Jesus, right? Because there's some people who say they believe in Jesus, but they may believe in, in in a way that you don't approve of. So I don't believe Jesus is God. I don't believe Jesus is the Messiah. I think he was a good guy. I just don't think that uh, he's God or the Messiah. You know, I, like for sure he was a good guy. Like if anyone unalived him, they did something wrong. I don't think he deserved that, even according to Jewish law. So that's pretty much it. That's pretty much it. Now let me ask you a question. So you don't think, so you you accept Jesus' existence, right? You accept... Um, In you faith, accept, I mean, it, it doesn't offend me. His existence doesn't offend me. Like I'm... Not offend me. Like, I'm glad that he existed. The world is a better place because Jesus existed. Um, I wish every Christian would become Jewish, right? And and not have to believe in some sort of Messiah in order to please God. Uh, but fine. If, if um, like, believing in Jesus means that I could enjoy Christians fighting evil and supporting the Jewish people, then his existence is a net gain from that perspective. I, I, I can see why you have that perspective 100%. But what I don't understand is that I kind of I, I kind of have a hard time trying to understand is um, a lot of Jewish people that I've talked to, they will they will accept, like, and correct me if I'm wrong, but they will accept Jesus, like, you know, they will accept Yeshua of Nazareth as a, as an actual person, like a, just, just like a normal human being, just like me and you, that, ha that has existed or that, that did exist, but kind of take away, um, you know, the supernatural aspect of him, of, of, of him not being Lord, you know? No. So what I'm trying to understand is what makes you come to that conclusion of him not being Lord, but, but yet, it's, uh, yet accepting him as an actual person that existed. Well, that's a huge leap. We accept a lot of people as, as great individuals, um, people who are praiseworthy, who exist, and we don't claim them to be God or the Messiah. Right. I mean, put the notion of the Messiah aside first. The idea that you're going to elevate someone to the level of God. There's a lot of great people on this planet who suffered worse than Jesus suffered, let's say. Right. I mean, there's 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 people who've walked into battle. Right. I mean, like for the sake of your freedom and my freedom and have taken and who've been harmed uh, very severely and lost loved ones and stuff. But now Jesus, because he claims to have died for your sin, that makes him God. Right. I, I, where does that necessity come from to in some way have a God that you can see that that, uh, you know, the notion of God being loving and caring and graceful already existed in the Jewish Bible. Why did we have to redefine it in the person of Jesus? Right. I mean, there was the Sorry, Torah not enough for us. Last thing you, can you repeat that last thing you just said? God appears in the Torah as loving, caring. The notion of grace was there. Um, it was universal. It was for like anyone who wanted it, even though humanity, one could say, didn't really deserve it. Um, if God was offering himself to humanity from that perspective before the New Testament, why do we even need Jesus to in some way humanize God for us? So why, why did, basically your question is like, why did God have to, you know, you know, even though you don't believe it, believe in it, but it had to come in the flesh to take to be the human sacrifice. Yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, according to the Torah itself, this notion of according being a human sacrifice, the Torah never talked about, you know, us expecting a human sacrifice, at least not literally. Uh, so unless he speaks to his people in riddles, that's kind of cruel. Um, he just told us that in order to please him, we have to keep his laws, which again didn't include sacrificing people or waiting for some atonement some global atonement to be done in our behalf. Um, I mean, I see what you're saying, but I feel like I, I wish I had a, I wish I had a, 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 a,
wish I, I I'm not I'm not in a position where I could like fully like I'm not gonna say debate, but you know I haven't. No, I don't think the average Christian has answers for this. I haven't, I haven't fully read my Bible yet. Like I want mm. to, which I, I'll get there. You know. I'm glad that you're a Christian, by the way. I mean, like, I prefer you to be Christian than an atheist, and I prefer you to be Christian than a Muslim. Uh, I prefer you to be a Muslim than an atheist, in 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 most cases, because um, I think Christians are fighting evil, and Christians do believe in the God of Israel. Um, I I would prefer you to be Torah observant at least, to live the Word of God, instead of just I don't know, chase after it because of some emotional experience. I mean, some people want God without the obedience. So that does nothing for the world. Uh, but Messianic Jews, I mean, I'm proud that they exist. Yeah, I think, I think Messianic Jews is, is something that's very beautiful. Um, but it's, it's, it's been something, at least from my understanding, that Messianic Ju Judaism has been something that that's really has been, it's, it's the, I mean, they're like the first Christians, you know? Yeah. They were the first Christians, but that was it. That was a little, you were trying to ask in the first place. I, I, First off, I mean, for me to even like come up here, I feel like I needed to have more uh, biblical, biblical, biblical knowledge. But I see what you're trying to say. I, I, I like I like your thinking, but what I don't understand is, and, and I think I'm, I could probably understand more if I if I get more biblical knowledge. Is just that the idea of, of what you're saying, like I, you're saying basically you don't believe that according to the Torah, God didn't need to come in the flesh to die for our sins. Right. Yeah, no, that's exactly what I'm saying. In other words, he told us what he expected from us. He told the Jewish people that in order to please God, you have to keep commandments. This is what the Torah says, that we will be his special people only if we keep commandments. So anyone who heard that and bought into the system, don't forget, there was negotiations going on on Mount Sinai. God was pleading with the Jewish people or, or the Hebrews in the mixed multitude, to accept Torah, to choose life versus choosing a life of, of cursing and death, right? So in those negotiations, God was telling us what was in the contract, which it had to do with obedience, you know, submitting to him. But there was nothing secret. So once the Jews bought into that contract, into this covenant, the idea that he would change the details of that covenant later on and say, ah, because you didn't read riddles or decipher this word to mean this or that now i'm going to exclude you from the covenant because you don't have jesus seems like crooked dealings i mean it doesn't sound that that's becoming of a good god so this is why i feel like the christian god as he appears in the new testament seems like different right the whole revelation, new testament maybe. like it's definitely like weird in revelation when he's throwing people into like a lake of or what is it a river of fire or something like that's kind of silly well well i mean it may sound now, Jews believe in the same thing. I mean, Jews not also believe in hell. Like a lake of fire. That's purely revelation. Yeah, not Jews, an actual yeah. lake of fire, you know, but a place of torment and fire. Oh. Jews believe in it. They may, not, they may not call it a lake of fire. The Bible doesn't say it. Right? But the, Adam, right? Yeah, yeah. Right. But it's temporary in Judaism, right? It's only a year, right? Uh, it depends who you ask. <laughs> because according to Yeshua Notri, whoever that happens to be, some people say it's Jesus, it says that he's there for eternity. So there's there's people who, like for the heretics, it's so frustrating. That's a scary idea. Now, I think that's probably why he got crucified, isn't it? Is he was saying that Gehenna is eternal, and people didn't want to hear that. Uh huh. Maybe that's why he got crucified. I don't know. I don't, I don't know, know much about Jesus. I don't Jesus. think he should have been crucified. I don't think he deserved it. Not at all. I mean, whoever crucified Jesus, uh, did a terrible thing. Right? Yeah, I mean, technically the Jews, because according to Halakha, right. if the what? Like, so the Jews did it through the Correct. Romans. According to Jewish law, like if I throw you in a lion's cage, right? I mean, it's technically the lion that's eating you, but I'm liable. So right. it's it's not the Romans' fault, right? I mean, they're, they're just, you know, being Roman, whatever. I so, get it. But then there were, we were, like, the mockery thing, though. I'm pretty sure, like, in the narrative, at least in the gospel narrative that we've been provided, uh, like, there's, like, a whole mockery thing. They, like, torture them and make fun of them and stuff like that. But anyway. Yeah, but there's, so, I mean, they probably did it to anyone who wasn't Roman. You know, I mean, yeah. Like, we know better. Those Pharisees, whoever they were, and, 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 and Sadducees, knew better. So this is why we hold them to a higher standard. And not just put it on the Romans. I mean, some people do that. Don't you know the Romans didn't do it? You know, or like the Jews didn't do it. It was Romans. All right. Here. That'd be funny. Just every Italian you met, you'd be like, you crucified Christ. Forget about it. Bree? <laughs> Bree? 
Yeah. Now Bree's gonna tell me why do I have pot smoke? You know, like up, uh, like up in yeah, the thing. Yeah, I was wondering that too. Because they, like, first I had John Wayne, and then I had Ernest Hemingway. You know, too. I'm a big fan of both, and then I'm thinking, who else am I a fan of? Pop Smoke. You know, because someone told me change the picture already. You know, Do you so. Ah, like uh, what? Do you actually like Pop Smoke? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I feel invincible. Ooh, ooh. You know, come on, or <laughs> Christian Dior, Dior. Come on, I know Pop Smoke. Thing about rappers and stuff is sometimes they just do the dumbest stuff. Like I think he stole. Like millions of dollars worth of cars or something from the mob or the mafia or something like that. I think that's what got him killed. Is he like? That's not the story him? I heard. I mean, the story I heard was that somebody broke into his house to to steal jewelry, and then he confronted him, and then the guy like uh, you know shot him. Damn, he, dude. Yeah, and it was like an inside job. Yeah, I mean that's what I heard. And that's why you gotta be careful with rap, dude. In the music industry, you know they say it's all satanic. And then when you look at Pac and Biggie and like Suge Knight and that weird demonic ritual and stuff, I don't know. Bro. What, what are you talking? About? You're making up stuff, you know? No, well, they're all masons now. Sacrifice both of them, bro. I've heard that they sacrificed Tupac. Come on, man. Yeah. Have you not heard that? Who Suge Knight? Is he like the yeah, great, you know, Grand bro. Wizard? Is he a lizard? <laughs> the Grand Wizard, not a lizard. I don't know. I mean, he might be more like a witch. Yeah, why not? He rolled up to 50 Cent, and supposedly 50 Cent is that hard that he did. You know, I mean, Suge Knight just walked away. Yeah, well, it's 50 Cent. It's, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. He got shot in the face. Although, when he went to, like, Vanilla Ice, you know, Vanilla Ice gave him the rights to whatever he wanted. So, there you go. It's Vanilla Ice. He's not like Eminem, you know what I mean? He's different. Yeah, well, Eminem's got Dre, and, and, you know. Well, I mean, Eminem, I think, is – well, I mean, he's West Coast. He's not anti Suge Knight. Anyway. Yeah, he's just Eminem, like he's his own thing, like in terms of like, so yeah, if like Suge Knight goes up to Vanilla Ice, like in terms of like white rapper, obviously it's not going to, but no, if it goes to it. Eminem, in terms of white rapper, yeah. it's like. I don't know if Eminem, I mean, Eminem's a lefty, by the way. I mean, he's a big of Democrat. He, is. he did that like Trump album thing with yeah. Trump. <laughs> because, you know, I mean, how can you be hard and be on the left? It just doesn't work. You know, be some... I, don't, I try not to get political, but when you see lunacy. Like, you just can't not call it out. Like, when you see people acting crazy and, like, mutilating themselves and just talking about communism in America and stuff like that, it's just like, bro, you guys are nuts. Like, wow. and I don't even get political. But okay. whatever. Yeah. But, yeah, yeah, Pac is interesting, even though I'm pretty sure he's a bad guy. And then Biggie's interesting, even though I'm pretty sure he's a bad Tupac? guy. Tupac? Come on, man. I mean, Tupac. Like, where'd he go? He said he raped her, I'm pretty sure. All right. Man, don't use those words in this thing, man. I I'm pretty sure. I know, but use use the word grape. Or it's gonna, you know, right, right. play the rules. Right, that's not cool. Yeah, so supposedly Tupac uh, has a college degree. He's very well educated. He was, uh, yeah, he remember in Juice? In Juice, like, he didn't have one tattoo. And then a few years later, now he's all thug life. Come on. That's what I, yeah, I heard something. I saw something like that. Yeah, yeah. He, he, he's just intelligent, you know, and he, but, yeah, I mean, he's not a thug through and through, you know. Yeah, Easy E, all right, right. Easy E is a thug about. through and through. Right, but I remember some of the stuff he was talking about. Like, man, what's up with these churches, bro? We need to take their money because we don't have money, like stuff like no, that. No, he's a leftist. I mean, that's, I mean, he's very studious in terms of he learned this from his professors. You can't steal from churches and rap, like synagogues and like yeah. mosques, though. Oh, by the way, I mean, I started watching this show called, called, um, it's called Snowfall. You ever seen it? That it, sounds kind of familiar. Yeah, it's on Hulu. It's a good show. I mean, I haven't seen the what? I mean, it's about, uh, you know, snow, whatever, you know, the stuff that comes from Bolivia, Colombia, Ecuador. Okay. <laughs> and, um, yeah, 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 I don't know anything about that. But, but with the street vibe. Right. All right, Karina, I also heard that Tupac did ballet also. I didn't believe it until you just said it because someone else told me that. I just don't like, I've literally seen that video of him talking about, man, we need to steal the church's money and stuff like that. I'm like, bro, that's crazy. Yeah, no, you he's a leftist. From religious institutions. You know, his wife, no, his, his wife, no, his mom was a Black Panther, I believe, and had him when she was that's in jail or something. Anyways. Mm. So what's up, Theo? I mean, you changed your name. Yeah, yeah, I'm Judah B now, dude. Judah I reinvented B. myself like Kanye. <laughs> yeah, what's the B for? Uh, bee. That's just like a bee. Ah, I mean, oh, like a bumblebee. Mm, Devora, more like. Oh, Devora. Okay, all right. More like a honeybee. Buzz. That's what's yeah, that? buzz. <laughs> um, just like a vampire, but instead of two teeth, no, you have it's one than a pointy tooth. It's an insect. It's a whole different thing. You know what I mean? Okay. Right. But a bat is a marsupial, right? Marsupial. That's a funny word. Interesting. Hmm. That's it. All right. Oh, bro, I, got a, uh, I went like to. There's a church near where I live. Basically, there's like 
a lot of different like churches and stuff. And so I went to one that has like a box with free books. And bro, there was like a used King James Bible. I love like stuff with history attached to it because that's like a story that's in there and it's got highlighted like areas in it and notes and stuff like that, annotations. Very cool, dude. Very mystical. And it's King James, so it's even more weird and mystical because that guy was on something. Yeah. His translation is the only one that has the oh, Lucifer thing in it, which is a little suspicious. Is it? But, no, it's the Latin Vulgate. I mean, it came from the Latin Vulgate. Yeah. Yes. So a, Anyways, uh, what's he going to say? Oh, in terms of Bibles. But you can get Bibles in the dollar store for a dollar. You know what I'm saying? Sure, yeah. But, like, it's interesting to have one that's yellow. Like, it's almost brown pages. Like, it's that old. Yeah. Well, so Zev is looking for a reasonably priced Mishnah Torah. The problem is there's only one translation still in the market. Yale once made a translation. I don't know what I like. I never seen it. Mishnah, bro. All right, no, uh, no. Mishnah Torah is different. Mishnah is is is, is a small compared to Mishnah Torah. So what you can do is just download it all from. Uh, if you work in an office building that has a copier, oh, you know what? I have it in PDF, but it's just copied from um, copied from Chabad.org. I have a Chabad rabbi friend. It's pretty cool. All right. Except for the fact that they say that the Rebbe's Mashiach, and that's crazy because it's like an old man. and that's like Is that blasphemy or I don't know? It's whatever that. Why? Is Mashiach supposed to be a young man? Uh, it's definitely not like an old guy. Like, I'm pretty sure. I don't know. Uh -huh. Son of man, like glorious, righteous Messiah figure, old man. I don't know. All right. Anyways, so I have my friend here on, on YouTube, my friend Joseph, who's about to tell me. If I read the email he sent me about uh, Eger Teman, I mean, talking about Isaiah 53. Was that what you are going to tell me, Joseph? Oh, you know what? I can't hear him. Ugh. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Yeah, Isaiah 53 is definitely a question mark because, like, 2.2 billion people on earth are saying that's Jesus Christ. So then, like, 15 million Jews are saying, nah. -uh. <laughs> so it's like, what's going on? What's the noise? Oh my gosh, all of my speakers aren't working. Yeah, let's try this now. All right, Joseph, come up. Ah, Joseph dropped off. It was my fault. Yeah, That's anyway. an interesting name, Yosef. And an interesting figure in Torah as well. It's a popular name. It's kind of like, he's the star of Bereshit, really, by the end. Yosef is probably yeah. the most popular Jewish name outside of Jacob. Really? Jacob, Joseph, and Abraham. Well, uh, Yitz oh, okay. Well, the patriarchs for sure. Abraham, you know, like Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov. That's pretty common in America, isn't it? Shlomo is not that popular, trust me. And it's one of the funniest, I mean, it's funny to an English speaker. I mean, Shlomo. It just doesn't, uh, it's like Eliyahu. It doesn't flow. I think it does flow. Shlomo? Trust Eliyahu, me. That does flow to me. The but coolest Jewish name is, it? is obviously Asher. <laughs> obviously, you know, because, I mean... What's it mean? I don't remember. I forgot. It means like Asher? fortunate, um, you know, affluent. And also, like, because of Usher, like, it's kind of like accepted, you know? Is it Usher? Because it's it's Usher by Ashkenazim, right? And Asher, you know, by Sephardim. I'm sure that word is important for some reason. I can't remember why. But what's another interesting Hebrew name? Let's see. Mm. Bro, I'm curious about this. What is it? Jabetz? I was just reading Chronicles, and then there's this interesting thing right in the, like, during Yehuda's genealogy, his sons, like there's just a quick interruption, and there's this. We talked about it, I think, that obscure little character, Yabetz, and it's just like, that's it. There's stuff like that all over the Tanakh where it's like people literally have founded secret societies and cults and stuff off of just tiny stuff in the Tanakh, like mysterious figures like Tubal Cain, like, uh, like all these just little characters. It's interesting. Uh huh. Very obscure. The mystery, I think. Oh, yeah, and then, Yo oh, we're talking about Yosef. That's actually surprising, kind of, that, like, that's a very popular Jewish name. But also not so much, because the tradition is he's very beautiful, and, like, he was very, I mean, he took over Egypt and everything, so that's interesting. Uh, hello. Hello? 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 I'm hearing myself on YouTube. <laughs> I'm, more, I'm curious about that kind of a little bit because it's kind of a conspiracy theory. Well, there's nothing conspiracy about it. I mean, Israel apologized for it. Um, they they acknowledged that it was a mistake, whether that's true or not, and they made reparations for it financially, at least to the people who died. So, yeah. Now, anyone who says remember the USS Liberty is not uh, 
very pro-Jewish. Yeah, general. it's probably a what's his, like, what do you call it? Not a good, you know the word. I'm not going to say it. Yeah. 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 Anyways, hmm. anyways. Let's all see, right. What else have we been up to, man? Let's see. Ooh, today I bought a poncho, bro. I've been thinking, like, that's an interesting item of clothing to wear, a poncho. A poncho. Well, I mean, according to Halakha, like, a poncho requires tassels. It requires tassel? tzitzit. What's it, what even is a tassel again? I tzitzit? Oh, you're talking about tzitzit. I know what a tzitzit are. Yeah, yeah because course. it's a four-cornered garment. Sure. So it means that they require... Uh... I wonder, what's the ruling on if you're just wearing tzitzit on your waist with a poncho? Or do you have to wear the tzitzit? We have to have two pairs of... Oh, you're thinking of like messianic tzitzit. Huh? Well, so messianics put their fringes on their belt. Or at least some of them do. At least, uh, not, I've seen Orthodox Jews do that. No, it looks like it's in the belt. It's actually a shirt they wear under, and that is, uh, uh, I mean, it comes yeah, up to the belt loop. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Huh. Interesting. I wonder if it matters. <laughs> uh, according to Jewish law, it does. Yeah, I feel like what really matters is, I don't know, you tell me what matters, bro. All right, hold on, hold on. Hold on. Shalom All right. Alechem, shalom. What's up? What's up? What's going on? Do you, do you, uh, Rav? Not, nothing much. Rav Yosef. Good work. Thank you, Yosef. I'm not going to burn your Ruach today, Yisrael. I'm going to leave you alone today. I'm actually... Burn my Ruach? All right. I'm telling you, it's, it's, it's that type of game that gets you the women. There is no way that you could roll into any live and not girl, like, not make the women feel like you're the man if you talk so confidently. I'm just saying, you know, touche. Did he say he's going to burn your roof or what did he say? No, he burn said that he's not going to burn my spirit today. Like, Who's this guy? What's his name? <laughs> you can't burn a spirit unless you're God, dude. No, I know, I know. Don't take it so no, literal. No, no. Listen, listen. Can you be not the man of Ruach? All right, anyways. See, he, he, he doesn't understand, Aaron Israel. He doesn't understand. Right, is that the, like the... The Israelite, like a uh, Lashon Kodesh thing that's like made up or whatever. No, no, no. It's not made up. no he's it's saying it right. He understands what I'm saying, but like, it's like, it's no, no, but you have your own take on it that's like twisted and made uh, up. All right, all right. No, no. It's not twisted and made up because it, it's all referenced Hebrew. So it, it's not. But it's like not real. It's made up. No, no. Stop, stop, stop. It's, it's real because it's in the text. Right? But let's not go into a silly discussion. I mean, let's get into something well, you serious. Can go ask a rabbi and show him your guys' language. No, right? no. Don't do that. Don't do that. Don't do that. All right, wait, great, great. Hold on, hold on, great. Hold on, hold on. Here, Judah, I'm gonna bring you up, Judah, like in a minute. Just let me drop everyone, like just so Gray and I could have a discussion. No, I get it, 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 I get it. All right, guys. All right. So Gray, it's just you and I. Yeah, he was. He wasn't gonna let us talk, fam. So you you know how Hashem is. He does what he does, and so when you have a different type of. Uh, worshiper, we know that th there's different services, but the same creator, right? Uh, maybe, <laughs> maybe. All right. Well, so tell me about yourself. Well, so I'm a transcendent style of uh, worshiper and human. I uh, I grew up Christian, but uh, I started to learn in Midrash, uh, and then things I st things started to come to me. So I don't have a what you call a, a, a dialect of Hebrew, but I understand uh, a lot of the Hebrew uh, that's spoken, but I know that I'm still sort of like, it's like a radio frequency, right? I'm still tuning in a little bit, and uh, not a little bit, a lot bit, but I, I have studied the, the biblical Hebrew for many years, so I do understand a little bit of the Lashon HaKodesh. We call it the HaLashon HaKodesh. So we're actually into like developing our own uh, language. It'll take our lives and, and, and our ancestors. It'll take life after life. I probably won't be able to uh, get maybe even... Where's your community at? Huh? Well, so I've, I've moved around. I've, I've been around different uh, Jews in different areas. Uh, I try not to hang around Jews and Christians too much. I try to stay separate. Right, I'm a Kodashim. You heard of that word, a Kodashim? Yeah, yeah. I mean, like one of the Kodashim, like like yeah. the holy ones. Right. Yeah, yeah. That's that's what my order from Hashem is to be a Kodashim. So you heard of the Torah Learning Center in Kansas City? No. 
So yeah, they invited me there one time, but I did not, I, I declined to go because, you know, the belief systems are so, uh, you know, different. I, we, we believe in Yahshua HaMashiach, right? So mm -hmm. they would say, oh, he's Messianic or he's this and that. You know, there's, so, there's a lot of name calling for the different people uh, that believe different things, but I don't hold anyone, uh, you know, I mean, I'm just a human being, right? A man, right? So I don't uh, have any hard feelings toward people, right? Okay. All right. Well, you probably already know I don't believe in Jesus or Yeshua. I think he's a nice guy, a uh, person. I just don't think he's God or the Messiah. Uh, but I do believe in the Torah, and that's what I promote. And I encourage people who do believe in Jesus to live a Torah lifestyle with Jesus. So, so Hashem will bless you for that, ultimately. Now, the thing with you and uh, Yeshua, HaMashiach, or Jesus Christ, that's a, I think that's more of a family, personal thing. Hmm. But you'll be blessed for telling people to uh, learn the Torah and stay the Torah, because the Scripture says, uh, uh, "Not a least pen, not a, not not one drop of the Torah will be replaced until everything is fulfilled." So, no, you know, if you if you're Torah, hey, t hey man, I'm Torah too. So don't worry about that. We, hmm. I just don't I don't play the games. Like I don't we don't have like six point stars in our house. We have a menorah, right? Because it's in the Bible. But the six point star, we rebuke it because of like Amos chapter five, verse 26. So we're big in the Torah, too, in the Old Testament. Uh, we're also big in the Tanakh, but not the Talmud. Yeah, but how do you so know that star is the star of Molech? I mean, how do you right, know? Right, right. So we, we don't we don't know exactly what it is, but we consider in our household any star to be detestable to uh, Hashem. Uh, every star? I don't know. No, like, I get it. I get it. Right. So yeah, most people don't know. Hey, Everybody has to make sure we try to hygiene as much as we can. No, I hear if you. If you've been taught that when you're growing up, you know, so we sort of, I've, my study leads toward the Estara, right? The Estara. Uh, when Solomon uh, did did things in his temple and things like that, though I don't have the complete understanding, there's, 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 uh, there's still more research to be done, right? And so we don't practice Kabbalah, uh, esotericism, or or uh, Mandeism or any of that, right? We just sort of just stick with what the scripture says, uh, the Brit Shah and the Old Testament, both the whole book. I read the other canons like uh, Sefer ha Hanach, Enoch. Mm -hmm. I read Enoch. Uh, I read all the books, right? People call, you know, they think it's a heretic thing because I study the scripture like I do, but it works for me, right? Yeah, I'm not against people studying whatever book they want to study as long as it brings them closer to Torah observance. Um, in terms of, you know, I, I kind of feel like that also about the New Testament. If, if studying the New Testament is going to get you to follow the Torah more precisely or make you feel closer to God, which will enable you to keep the Torah more, then I'm all for you reading the New Testament. It doesn't, you know, I don't think God plays these games. First of all, God never told us to create a canon. He never said canonize these books. And, you know, include these books, exclude that book. I consider this apocrypha. I consider this divinely inspired. That's all man-made. The only thing God told us is that keep my commandments. That's all he says. Now, he wants us to write them down. So, essentially, the word of God, the only word of God, like, are the commandments of God. That's the word of God. And then every other book that, that the rabbis and the sages have sanctioned um, are books there to bring you closer to the Torah. That's it you know, whether, so, yeah. So, okay, so we have to, as, as in our, our system of faith, this, I'll, I'll tell you just a little bit about it. So we, uh, we, we have to know the Torah in case the law goes, uh, the, in case the land goes lawless, right? Dystopia hits, right? We have to be able to rebuild uh, for the creator. We have to be able to institute justice, right? So we have to be masters of the Torah. Though we are under the Torah, we're under the Ruch HaKadosh, the Holy Spirit. Come on, man. Come on. Judah, bro, why are you doing it's it's <laughs> You see, man, I try to let you back up. I mean, you're like, uh, I'm telling you. I know, but you're coming up high. Here, look, I'll tell you, I never, ever try to correct people's Hebrew pronunciation. I'll tell you why. Because nobody knows who has the correct Hebrew pronunciation. Right, and it's spelled different too. Right. right. So like, if you hear a Yemenite speak Hebrew from Yemen, where well, they speak something called Temanit, which is Judeo-Arabic. And it sounds very different than what you hear in Israel today. You know, and they, yeah. I'm so sorry, but like, 
people try to stop people like me and you from connecting because we have the youth Hashem, okay? And so, like, we, we're we just now really trying to, like, develop what he's going to do, do through us. But I see life as a test, and so I'm interested in meeting humble servants of the Creator, re- regardless of, of, of if they believe in Jesus Christ, Yahshua, Hamashiach, or, or Allah, or, or Eli, or Elohim, or whatever they call. Oh, well, I mean, I mean... I view Muslims as a different religion or belonging to a different religion. So, so do you have a computer? Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Okay, so look, look this up real quick. Let me share something. Oh, man, come on, come on. I mean, just just, just mention it just because it's going to be hard for me. I'll mention I'll type it in the comments. Right. So I found out that uh, Eli, and also two spelled this way, A A L A H A L A H. okay, A-L-A-H. it's Strong's Hebrew. All right, it's like Aloha. Uh, it's the same Allah. It comes from the right. same Shorish. Right. You know. No, no, yeah, no. The word just means God. But it, it's... That's all it means. That's right. That's right. Yeah, yeah. But people don't know, brother, that it's Hebrew. That's all I'm saying. Oh, I think most most Hebrew speakers know that Allah... Yeah, Hebrew speakers know, but not the other people. Oh, Hebrew right. Speakers. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, Arabic's not. Yeah. Um, a lot of these cultures are lacking vowels. So all they have is essentially consonants. So um, as long as the root words are the same, the words are essentially the same, especially when they're referring to the same thing. I mean, if Allah, you know, I mean, it's the same as Eloa. It's, it's, in Hebrew, there are no... It is, it is. That's yeah. right. That's right. Yeah. But see, here's the thing. Let me tell you another study that I've been on, though. And we can correct each other later. Today is not a good time to embarrass each other. I'm already feeling like a, I'm not I'm trying to a, a, a little attack. But so, okay, so you have, you've heard of the word hova, right? Hova, yeah, in Hebrew, right. it would be disaster, right, or ruin. Uh, it depends. Hova. I mean, how it's written. It depends on how you use it. Like, yeah, ayin, ayin would mean nothing or witnessing, right? It could mean right with the hey, it. right? I mean, with the chet, it means something else. I mean, the way you're saying it is like. Hova, it's yeah. like over. Oh, anyways, yeah, go ahead. Right. And so people don't know that Yehovah is another way of saying God. So what I'm saying is, I think that uh, the religious aspect to people's belief is, has been the great hindering, right? I think that uh, the creator is communicating uh, through, through us with our prayer uh, and, and through our lives gradually as, as in uh you know you'd have to have uh you'd have to have math to like have currency in, in a market to buy right and the father takes his time with us not not comparing it to money because we know money is of uh of the evil one the adversary of men money but why no no i mean the love of money th- that's what i mean it's, uh. it's all about the worship right Okay, yeah, I mean, dealing with the Hebrew. It's all about the worship. I enjoy money. You know, I mean, I may not love money, but I enjoy it a lot. Right, but no, we got to have it. We got to have paper, right? We got to, we got to invest. We got to, we got to try to make it. But at the end of the day, people will uh, pervert uh, the ideology of coming up, the ideology of being successful. Uh, They'll pervert the ideology of religion. Uh, They'll, they'll, they'll try to like have their own view of the scripture. And, I, and I'm really uh, against that type of style. When I seen you said uh, Judaism up here, you know, I, I wanted to come speak uh, to a fellow believer because I know that uh, that a lot of the, the Jew, Jews or people that are Jewish would, would see Yahshua Hamashiach as a troublemaker, uh, as an antagonist, and, and you know what I mean, and things mm. like that. Mm. But, you know, have you ever considered the fact that these Christians, like sort of need you to tell them the truth because you're you you hold you hold something that they don't off of the knowledge that you've been given that's what i do i mean i proselytize i may be the only rabbi publicly who actively seeks converts for their religion well so and also too so you know hashem yashua hamashiach is what we say uh philippians chapter five uh, two verse nine uh given the highest name he says do not even call him rabbi so the muslims call him a messenger a prophet so we see it as sort of an ego trip you dig what i'm saying 
So yeah, but rabbi not, just means teacher. I mean, he also right. said, don't call anyone father either. Right, and he said also too, don't call anyone teacher. Right. So it's it's these it's these positions that we've inherited. Is what I what I truly believe. I think we have bigger issues than just titles. Um, of course we do. Of course we do. But here's the thing: if we don't if we don't get it that strict with them then they'll, they'll continuously use it as as, uh, as a stumbling block to, 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 to weaker people. Like, you won't do that. You know that you'll be held accountable, right? True? No, for sure. Like, I think it means don't mistreat the position or don't, like, under the guise of some title, you know, like, just, like, spew nonsense. I never tell people to respect me because I have the title rabbi. As a matter of fact, all my haters, the first thing they do is question me being a rabbi just because... They know how it works. They know that the vast majority of people care about titles. Titles mean nothing. I know some rabbis who don't know anything. I know rabbis who are like geniuses, right? So it's it, it, it's about what you know. And it's not what but you know. It's what you can defend, essentially. But here's the thing. The, the only issue is, is it's, 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 it's the, the people looking at you that way. The people, the higher, the higher-minded ideology. That's that's the thing. That's, that's what sort of... Not, redundant to who we are as true Yisrael, as the true people of the light. We, we're we farmers, ranchers, uh, cattlemen, uh, uh, travelers. We do it all. As far as them uh, laming us up and titling us to their brand. Okay, hold on. Maybe come a day where we won't, we won't have such names. Like, That's all I'm saying. Bro. I'm going to step out for five minutes, you know, but my friend violating TikTok here, like he could continue the conversation. Uh, no, I just came out real quick to ask what does pop smoke have to do with anything? Well, before pop smoke, I had Ernest Hemingway. Before Ernest Hemingway, I had John Wayne. So they're guys I admire. Um, I mean, I'm a big pop smoke fan. Pop smoke? What about him? You like his music? Yeah, yeah, I like his music. I mean, I don't care about John Wayne's personal life. I like his movies. And Ernest Hemingway, I like his books. So you listen to rap? Yeah, yeah. What you don't? That's, that's unexpected. No, I do, but like I didn't expect you to. <laughs> oh so, no! Like, New York City drill. Wow. Yeah, no, I'm a thug. Yeah, I'm a thug for Hashem. Yeah, say, say woo woo. Woo say woo. woo. <laughs> what do you mean? Out of this, out of this. All right, all right. Anyways, I'm from Miami. Yeah, come on, everybody listens. You tell me the Rav Yosef didn't pop in. You know the occasional, you know, Tupac in there. Like in his, you heard the story that in Israel, the newest BMW to always hit the shores of Israel was like designated to to like Ravadi Yosef because he only rode in BMWs, but like the latest latest BMWs. You ever heard of the Jaguar Rebel? No, no. Who's that? And he got called the Jaguar Rebel because he used to drive around in a Jaguar. Oh, there you go. No, these rebels got money. I mean, these rebels. He actually, he's actually not alive anymore. He passed away. Uh huh. Um, and then it was Alexa Saraba. Alexa, uh, interesting. Yeah. So, what kind of rebel are you? What kind of car do you got? Yeah, I'm like the rebel for Michigan, and they call me the Michigan rebel. Wow, that's that's a pretty funny one, actually. Yeah. Michigan rebel. Michigan, Michigan, okay. No, was macht the yid? Was this nice? Deutsch, Deutsch, Sprach in Deutsch, Sprach in Yiddish, Jewish. You may. Okay, all right. That's it. Enough Yiddish. How do you know Yiddish? Who told you Yiddish? I've, I mean, I get around. I told you. I mean, I met the summer rub. I met Rav Aaron one on one. He's not the summer rub. He's the summer rebel. Ah, uh, wait a minute. All right. So summer rub is um, Rav Yoilish. I'm a Zalani. I'm a Zalani, not a Oh, really? All right. I also dive in at uh, you know Rav Zaman Live show like in Williamsburg. I like Zaman Live. Yeah, he's my David. I don't listen to him, but I like him. Right, so the Satmarov was Rav Yoilish, right? Huh? But the Satmarov was Rav Yoilish. No, no. Correct. Yeah. He called himself Satmarov, even though he was a rebel. Anyways. Very nice. Yeah, yeah. Anyways. 
What's next? My head hurts. That's what's up. Mm. What's up? What's up? What's up? Do you hear about that fire in Miami? They, they set a synagogue, I think it was, on fire. Who did it? Pro Valleys? Mm, nah, some old white dude. I heard about oh, this. They were trying to light like uh, something, but it didn't light or something like that. No, they, no they, they lit a car on fire and then it spread to like the synagogue in Miami. Interesting. Uh, Erasio, let me ask you a question. Have you heard about, um, by 1948, a little prior to 1948, when they were going to give the land to the Jews, did you hear about the Gouda getting involved or you didn't know anything about that? I mean, the Gouda was anti-Israel. I mean, what? No, they were they were actually trying to say it. They were really they weren't anti Israel. No, a good Israel was an anti Zionist organization. Anti Zionist. Yeah. yeah, but they were pro Israel. A good Israel? Pro Israel? I mean only because it's called the good Israel doesn't mean they were pro Israel. Yeah, because they were fighting um they obviously had no chance, but they were fighting that the um that the what's it called the the British give it to the Aguda since they're you know more Jewish or oh, right? oh well or just religious so I know that there was um all right but so the argument because people always ask like, how can the Torah Karta like live in Eretz Israel because most of the Torah Karta people live in Eretz Israel and be anti like Eretz Israel and it's because they were there before 1948 so there was a vote taken <laughs> on. Correct. from Samer, which were Hungarians. So no, no. Okay, just so most people don't know. Ones, wait, wait. Ones, hold on, hold on, hold on. I mean, I know David Weiss. You know, I, I've davened in the Torah card to show in Monsi, like before it burned down. You know, like Moshe Beg, David Weiss. Anyways, the Torah card to, most people don't know. Wait, wait, hold on. on. Who is, who is, sorry. So the Torah card to, they're actually Litvish. They're not Hasidish. If you go to the Natura Karta Shul, I think it's in Gaula, like or Mersharim, they don't dive in Nusak Svarg. They dive in Nusak Ashkenaz. Like people think that Natura Karta, like only because he's, like most people know that Litvaks also were Strimals. You know, but it's not a branch of Satmar. I mean, Satmar is completely, I mean, yeah, they're anti Zionist, but they're anti Zionist from a different perspective. I mean, they don't march along with Palestinians or anything like that. I mean, there's like, you told us Aaron. You're thinking told us Aaron as an extension of Satmer or like maybe Hasidim Malachim, which are also like kind of super super. What? I'll be right back. Yeah. Yeah. Children in Gaza using tuna cans for shoes. Tuna cans? Yeah, this is exaggerated. Anyway, I don't want to talk about politics in this show. That's some good, prop that's some good propaganda. Good yeah, no, they know how to spin it, you know? <laughs> they know how to spin it. The truth is, I mean, they learned it from us. I mean, to learned, be honest. Wow. Learned what? Uh, Come on, man. I mean, I've worked in Kiruv, you know, for a pretty long time. You know, so, yeah. like, in Kiruv, in, 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 in terms of, of, of like, I mean, I was never a mashalach, you know, but people who are into like fundraising know like the phrase that there's no business like Shoah business. The idea of exploiting the Shoah for like financial gain and influence is something that we sort of, you know, like it's it's not something, you know, it's it's been done in an unhealthy manner. I mean, to a very unhealthy level. I, most people don't talk about this, but it's true, right? It's, yeah, I mean... I mean, I know of him. Yeah, I mean, he's a Yemenite guy with the little pointy thing. Yeah, yeah. So you should check out his um, uh, debate. Like, this was a bunch of years ago. He had a debate with some Natura Karta guy in Israel. Yeah, but he's uh, a, like a radical himself, you know? I mean, he's not a rationalist. He's like a... He actually... Um... Yeah, but he's not, pro... he's, not, he's not that pro-Zionist. You'll see when he talks. He's not that pro-Zionist. No, also, like Rabbi Mizrahi is not pro-Zionist either. You know, these guys, they, they, they're what's called non-Zionist, meaning, yeah, but they're what's called non-Zionist. So they'll live in the land, but they won't say halal during Yermat's They won't say the, with the tefillah in Medina. 
but they're not anti, like, they don't want the state to be dismantled. I remember when I met David Weiss, he gave me his card. It, it, on his card, it said, pray for the peaceful dismantlement of, like, like of the state of Israel, which is, uh, I guess, a summer position. But so anyway. Listen, um, at least in a terror character from America, they definitely come from Samra, but Samra completely condemns them. Right. You saw the video of Rabzama Live, which is the Rabzama Live is the more strict one. Rabaran is more chilled out. Yeah. Rabzama Live this past year gave out a whole entire speech condemning them. You know what they did? They went into Williamsburg. They went to Manhattan, where no one who knows who Rabzama Live is, and they start screaming Rabzama Live, Yamach, and whatever. And they started literally cursing them out. A couple of, couple of Samar Hasidim saw them, probably coming from BNH, and they literally started fighting. They beat this, they beat them up, grabbed the sign away, and they deserved it. You know, I think Satmer, I guess apart from Skver, because the whole you we heard the whole notion, yeah, you know, they were co for Hagat and they like beat some guy up, you know, with the with the cattle prong. But Satmer seems well, to listen, be According to the Rambam, according to the Rambam, you know, he I'm says, "Oh no, I'm not. A, I'm not saying anything. I'm saying that this is what 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 Skver was known for doing, and I think it was like this. I mean, how many square verbers are there? Just one. Currently, I'm not even sure. I'm, I don't know so much. You know, anyways, so in terms of the most violent, in terms of the most violent, like Hasidic groups, I think it's Sotmer. You know." It was Satmer that kidnapped this Lubavitcher guy and shaved his beard, like on on uh, Shavuos. Have you heard about? Listen, listen, the thing about these Hasidim are that they are fanatics. Every single Hasid just has fanatics. Yeah, when they were fighting, there were the fanatics that took it. Ser- they took it physical. Um, Satmer, when they fought, there were the fanatics. Till this day, the Satmer's already made peace, but you can still see the fanatics fighting on Telegram and stuff. You right, know, if you're right. so Satmer, why do you have Telegram? So you know, like. There's a bunch of fanatics, you know, and every every group you look at, like you were talking about earlier about Hinduism, that there's some radicals. Yeah, every single group in the world you're gonna look at, there's gonna be radicals. That's just a fact, no matter what you say, you know. All right. The question is, if you're gonna condemn them or not, or are you gonna support them? You know, it's. it's All really... right. Here, Josh, so you're in charge. You're five minutes. Give me five minutes. Up. Well, let your mom. How can I be in charge, Rabbi? I got a quick question. No, wait. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Oh, Old Testament, is there a distinction between God and Lord? That's my only question. All right, wait, wait, wait. <laughs> isn't, isn't God and Lord the same thing? I don't know. That's why I'm asking, honestly. I mean, we only believe in God, so if you're talking about the Lord, I know. You're talking about God. Sometimes the Lord is put in there, but sometimes Lord only means like certain things where god means everything and i've just been reading a lot and it's messing with my mind so i wanted to ask the rabbi gotcha how are you doing fishnet and i don't know man i don't know you yeah, seem sad you seem kind of kind of sad man i've been fishing all day and it's like 30 mile an hour wind wind beat me to death today but like i i, I can't get over the actual real world and then the Dreamland Narnia TikTok world where uh you know they think the H group is winning. It's I, I it just boggles my mind every single day. Is they don't live in the real world, those people, you know? Um but let me ask you a question. Who's a better fisherman? You or AK fishing? Okay. I have my money on you. I'll I'll pretend you didn't really ask me that. <laughs> <laughs> Have you seen my videos? You, 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 Go ahead. No, I haven't. I'll, I'll check them in a few minutes. Have you, would you consider using AK fishing as bait? I don't think that's right, dude. Come on. I haven't I'm seen kidding, him in a kidding. while. I haven't seen him in a while. Is he still uh, around? there like, yeah, of course he is. Two, three days ago. I think it was like Sunday night. Um, He was in back for all night. Oh my God. Well, not all night, but the morning curled out of his tunnel because he needed some money and he got a lot of money they kept him over fifteen thousand coins like on one account fifteen thousand the other account i mean fifteen thousand is less than a couple hundred but right, right, right. um 
the other county got another 5,000. Like, the pro pallies, even though they hate him and they hate uh, everything about him, they just love the fact that he fights with the Zionists, and that's why they pay him. It's bullshit. And they're using him, and he knows it, and he doesn't give a fuck because they're paying him. He's like their puppet, you know? Is he back home with his parents or not? I don't think so, no. I don't want to talk about that because okay. a lot of shit went down with him and his parents. I know, I was, I was and watching. Like, I don't want to talk about like that. Yeah. Like, if he does something on TikTok Lives, I'm going to talk about it. But if he's going to do something in his, his house that people talk about and say stories, I don't think it's my business to talk about it. Unless he said it publicly, which he never did, so... I was just watching whenever he said that he his mom's kicking him out, dad's kicking him out because he said uh, they were afraid he was going to dox everybody and then somebody was going to come to the house and then alive them all. And uh, something, about the story, they did something, to his, something about his computer, they did something to his computer or something. But anyway, anyway uh, we don't need to talk about it. Yeah, incorrect. There's more details to it, which you wouldn't say. But yeah, let's not talk about it. Um, but what else? Uh, you think the war is almost over? I'm hoping so. Um, what do you guys think? Everybody's bottlenecked in Rafa, right? I think so. I'm realizing at this point... Just, just don't thing, listen to them. Huh? Just don't listen to Biden. Whatever you guys do, do whatever the hell you want to do. Don't listen to Biden. Do whatever is best for Israel, not... Well, he doesn't want you guys to go into Rafa. Well, I'm not in Israel. I'm not in the IDF, so, you know, you got to tell that to the people in the IDF. But, you know, I don't think, I don't think Israel is going to listen to, to Biden. I think they're going to do what's best for their country, you know? Screw Biden. You know? Nobody should listen to Biden. Israel should just take over all of uh, Israel. Or, yeah. Israel, Israel. Right. Yeah, let's not take over all. Take over all. Of it. All right, all right, no pause. All this like stuff going on, man. All right. Anyways, yeah. All right. So, what's the difference between Lord and the four-letter name of God? Yes, sir. Nothing. <laughs> uh, like God is also referred to as Lord too. You know, um, clearly, like that. Four letter name of God is the actual name. I mean, one's a title, like, and the other one is the actual name. But in terms of reverence, um, I don't know. It, yeah. Whenever, whenever I read Lord, is it always no. referring to God the Creator? No. No. Well, it, in English, it is. Um, I don't think, I don't know if the King James uses Lord for anything else. Um, right? Because I think it may use the word master. But yeah, yeah. It's interesting. In Spanish, is similar. You know, señor. I mean, means means uh, means uh, God, or they'll say like el señor. Probably that's the difference. Or the Lord. Oh, that's interesting. I mean, I guess if you put the, that kind of makes you know who you're talking about. You know, it's kind of like the Lord. It's so you're not talking about but your boss upstairs. Okay, let's see. Hold on. All right. Hey, Ross. Asher. Oh, good, man. Are Welcome you back. are you familiar with um, Piquet de Eliezer? Uh, thank you, Rabbi. I'm dropping. Yeah, no problem. Thank you. Uh, yeah, no, man. Uh, no, just Hello? Bro. That's a lie. Can you hear me? Lie. All right, it's fine. It's fine. You don't have to. Yeah, go ahead, Renegade. Dude. I came to argue. All right, yeah, Sorry, no. Man. I mean, that's how I learn the most, and that's how people learn the most via okay, the dialogue. Well, I, thought, <laughs> I thought it'd be straight up. <laughs> it's no. just that you know what's up. Yeah, no. Um, I, I mean, I welcome it. But go ahead. Um, so Piquet Eliezer, I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with him. Um, he's a Spanish philosopher. Um, he's actually from Barcelona. Um, he's actually from Barcelona. Um, he's actually from Barcelona. He's actually from Barcelona. He's actually from Barcelona. He's actually from Barcelona. I mean, how early are you talking about? Uh, we could say around Philo. Oh, for sure. For sure, yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay, so like, the big ideas... Oh, wait, sorry, my, my uh, good pasta. Um, there, 
was many ideas that people held within Judaism. So, like, for example, like the Sadducees, I know that they didn't believe in the resurrection of the dead. That was something that was common. Pharisees kind of differed between that as well. And uh, there was many different sects within the Pharisees. But there was one common idea regarding the multiplicity of the Godhead that was very, very common, that was upheld up until maybe the second century. How do you know? So, sorry? I mean, how do you know that it was held by all these sects? It was common. So, for example... Like, no, but common doesn't mean that it was... <laughs> that. The thing is... If it would have been that common, it would have appeared more in the Talmud. So, for example, there are instances in the, I mean, the Talmud, not necessarily that it's talking about the Godhead. There's one instance that pops into my mind when Rabbi Akiva looks up to the heaven and he sees two thrones, but he never makes the connection between the Messiah being some sort of little God or part of God, right? It just never doesn't, it, it never says it. I'm not saying that maybe it was so much common knowledge or such, you know, or common knowledge to such a level that they didn't have to say it, but it's just not there, you know, for you to say like, oh, well, they all knew that there was a, some sort of complex unity in the Godhead. Yeah, no, I mean, it, it, it does come across that way because like when you do look at the, um, I think it might've been in the Midrash where they offered the idea of a Metatron. Yeah. Of somehow being some, uh, I guess you could say like a, another lesser God, as opposed sure. to Yahweh, so it's not just Rabbi. Akiva, yeah, I mean, idea. yeah, but they never so, explained it like that. Here, like Metatron comes from the word Metatronos. It's like behind, behind or before the throne. So it's it. I understand what you're saying, but nowhere in rabbinic literature is it explained how you're explaining it, right? It seems that there may have been one person who held like this. This notion of the two powers. When Rabbi Kiva made the statement. He was chastised by all his his colleagues, meaning that I'm not saying that that he was necessarily wrong. I mean, I don't believe in what he believed in regarding that, but it shows that the notion of two powers wasn't a monolithic idea. When people say the rabbis agreed, that's kind of dishonest because the rabbis don't agree on anything um, unless you're taking a vote on a practical issue, like which is what we consider halakha. Well, yeah. I mean, they're still arguing today, but what we would agree that rabbinical Judaism is not the form of concept of Judaism of what was held at that time. Like that, that's a, this is like, it's a development. It's a reform. No, idea. no. Okay. So only like, if you consider rabbinic Judaism, everything the rabbis have written from the destruction of the temple till today, right? What I consider rabbinic Judaism, which is uh, authoritative rabbinic Judaism is what appears in the Mishnah and before. Right, that's authoritative. No one from any synagogue could override that. Right. Um, so this is talking about those same people. Rabbi Kiva would have been one of these rabbis, Rabbi Shimon Ben Yochai would have been one of these rabbis, but it's only a select handful of rabbis, not just the whole rabbinical system from its inception. Yeah, I, wouldn't say, I wouldn't say the whole rabbinical system, I mean, but the concept of the idea did live within the earlier uh concept ideas of Judaism. Oh no, it didn't. Is, okay, it didn't exist enough. I mean, can you think of some other instance in the Talmud where it alludes to two powers? I mean, I'm trying to think. I mean, even if it was three times, it's not very prevalent, right? I mean, I mean, for example, like the notion of two messiahs, that it may appear maybe twice in the Talmud, if if not just once. Um, but I can't think of of. I mean, I honestly can't think of more than one instance that it talks about Mashiach ben Yosef and Mashiach ben David, right? Uh, I mean, I can think of one. I think it's in Masechet Yoma. But for someone to say this shows that this was a prevalent idea held, first of all, this was at a time when there was no printing press. You know, so it's not like it was easy to spread an idea. To say that this was monolithic in some way, but only appeared once in the only rendition of how things ran back then that we have today, which is the Talmud, it's just hard to believe. I mean, not even Josephus talks about it, let's say, right? Or like Philo Judaeus that I know of, I mean, never spoke about two powers, but go ahead. Yeah, but I mean, but that wasn't their, that wasn't his job though. His job is is, is historian who's documenting the actual accounts that were occurring. I, I can't say that we can apply that concept to, to Josephus. Maybe Philo, and Philo does offer an idea regarding the multiplicity of the Godhead, even though it's not super clear. That's but insane. if you look at the Talmud, it's not that's not just the only instances. Like if you look at um, what the Gemara stated regarding the Egyptian king, where they had separated the sages and they had put them in different rooms, and then they they were expecting a different outcome. Um, regarding uh, what the sages had written down according to the, uh, the written Torah. Yeah, nobody believes that story for real. I mean, that's a legend. Uh, but... I, yeah, but, it, but, you're, but, you're, 
but you're denoting it to say that like it was just in these two instances that we see that what um, no 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 wait 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 these stories now what does that have to do with the you know, like with supposed well, duplicity the of the godhead the, the point is the outcome even with that just story of uh, the king of egypt when he separated the sages yeah they all came to the conclusion of god's multiplicity their power and i have oh no okay so that itself is the midrashic notion of that 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 the um, whatever 70 scholars was it is it 70 right i mean septa right 70 scholars came out with the exact translation of the torah yes. into greek like under the ptolemies right which are syrian greeks i believe so uh, i i i don't you know so that's understood as a midrash that they came out with the same one you know like no one ultimately believes that first of all it would be quite impossible and there's even like statements in the talmud that there's a holiday that we mourn that the Torah was translated into Greek. You know, so how could both these these statements be true? Now, I'm not taking either side. I'm just saying we ultimately don't know. Um, yeah, I mean, to even believe that 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 the Torah that they translated into Greek is in some way the same Septuagint we have today. So to in some way validate it when heck, we don't even have a Torah from that time today, right? Um, I'm. I'm not disagreeing with you, but I don't think that you should say things so matter-of-factly, like we know this and the rabbis believe this. Look at what rabbis believe in today regarding mysticism, okay? Things like simsum. If you go up to the average rabbi and you mention the word simsum, he won't know what the heck you're talking about, right? But a Kabbalist would, right? Or, or the sefirot. I mean, there's some rabbis who, who believe in it. There's some rabbis who don't believe in it. But now suddenly the two-power thing in the time of Jesus or in and around the time of the destruction of the temple was common knowledge. Eh. I mean, it's a stretch. I, would, I, mean, I see where you're, I see your position. I do think that, I mean, through these writings and these, these legends and these stories, I do think that we should take it into consideration given the grounds for God's nature. I mean, the Kabbalah offers definitely different emanations within it, right, regarding the, regarding the Godhead. So it's not something that's, un, all I'm saying is... Oh, right, yeah, un and I disagree with the Kabbalah. In terms of Kabbalah, 100%, that Kabbalah endorses... Christian metaphysical ideas more than any other source in Judaism. Kabbalah, 100%, right? I actually view Kabbalah more problematic than the 27 books of the New Testament. Uh, Ten times more problematic. Oh, that's crazy. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that, that's the thing, because I'm trying to understand where does rabbinical Judaism today get the grounds to deny, I guess, um, God being a multiplicity of persons when... Maimonides. So I'll tell you. That's why I'm saying, because it doesn't make sense. So Maimonides, Ravsadagon, and Unculus, essentially. Okay. Um, those are the major rationalists, you know, like, philosophical teachers of our religion. And they, in some way, spoke very matter-of-factly that Judaism doesn't believe in this, and they made it into principles, which never existed before. So this is why I won't argue this with a Christian. However, I will sort of correct them when they say, like, all rabbis believe this, because all rabbis didn't believe that, right? I'm sure some did, right? And I, heck, I mean, the Torah, the, but the Talmud talks about God having a shape, right? God putting on tefillin, uh, things that Maimonides would be completely against, right? Now, do I believe all the rabbis believe that God had a shape in the Talmud? No, I don't believe that either. The rabbis in the Talmud also believe the earth was flat. Now, I'm pretty convinced all the rabbis believe that, uh, but they were also six day creationists, while most Orthodox Jews, for some reason, are not today. Right. Um, it shows that things change, but in in terms of monolithic ideas amongst Jews and Judaism, it's it's hard to find outside of Balchuvas. Balchuvas are that will listen to anything that 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 Rabbi Mizrahi or Rabbi Tobias Singer will think uh, will think or like or say and think that speaks for all of Judaism. But people who actually know Judaism know how colorful it is in terms of belief. Our sages disagree, right? And if one sage says one thing, and then they, another sage offers a different idea or interpretation of the of the text itself, we would have to conclude that I mean, come to a conclusion that the only thing that we can take authoritative in this context would be the Torah. Correct. Right. Correct. So once we get to that, I mean, what does the Torah say? What does it say in Bereshit in 1924? It's Nothing explicit, Torah. though. Pardon me. It doesn't say anything explicit, concrete. To lead us to in any way help us define, um, like dissect God philosophically. I mean, it just doesn't tell us enough. This is why I'm not against the Trinity. I don't believe in the Trinity, right? No, but if I, some, I'm just, I'm, 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 I, I do. I hold to like the two, the whole two powers concept, right? 
that's fine. I mean, it doesn't. I'm just saying that, like, when we do see that and we we extrapolate these ideas, we we can come to a conclusion even just through the Torah itself with these two Yahweh figures, even with songs of songs five or five eleven. That's fine. Uh, Amos, even look at yeah, Amos. no, but all of his books, I mean, the only ones that I think you could use, I mean, just it, is in the Torah alone in terms of before, I mean, Sodom and Gomorrah was destroyed, the 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 God of, uh, like, the Yud Kevav came from heaven and the Yud Kevav came from earth. And I explained it in a different way in a video, but if you came to a conclusion that God has a partner, right, that is in some way himself, I don't know, like, I don't think that's a heretical idea. I just don't believe it. Right, but I don't think anyone could be, you know, kicked out of a community because of it, or should be kicked out of a community because of it, because you're just taking the Bible literally, okay? Um, and the idea that God's going to punish you for not believing it, but I mean, do you believe that? That if someone doesn't believe your rendition or your interpretation of of uh, God having two powers, that God is in some way going to hold that against him? All right, so then what's the big deal? Yeah, well, I don't know about merciful, you know, but it's it's kind of like. I mean, how's he gonna blame you, you know, for something that's not so explicit? So when you say explicit, are you are you holding to the notion that it has something has to be verbatim? Well, it has to appear prescriptive from from at least a theological perspective. Like I am this, you know, but only because the narrative could be read in in a pluralistic manner. And I actually have a video on this. How King Solomon also there's a verse that seems to show that this is a poetic way of writing that says King Solomon sent unto King Solomon. Fine. You know, I'm not saying that that's a, that, that, that seals the deal, but it shows that it's not so clear to, to in some way, you know, tell us that, that, that there's, there's a complex unity. Don't forget the book of Genesis, technically, to be honest, according to the text of the Torah, wasn't given on Mount Sinai. Okay. The only thing that was given to us on Mount Sinai was the Torah, right? So, and the Torah begins in Exodus chapter 12 or 20, I guess one could say, to the end of Deuteronomy, that transmission. Then later on in faith, we adopted the idea that, that Moses wrote the book of Genesis. But now because of an obscure passage in the book of Genesis, we're going to try to dissect it philosophically <coughs> from an authoritative matter, not from a devotional perspective. It, bo it doesn't bother me, you know, for you to believe in what they call Shitu, right? Like partnerships in the Godhead. It doesn't bother me. It It'll bother the heck out of Maimonides, right? But I think that as long as you're keeping Torah, where's the harm in that? Okay, however, so say, yeah. So when you say Torah, are you speaking colloquially as just like the first five books? Or are you speaking just as like a mitzvah? Oh, well, both, both. You know, colloquially, <laughs> what? What? Yeah, anyways, yeah. Well, so colloquially, the Torah is the five books of Moses. We know that, that God didn't give Moses five books. And we know that in... In what we call the Torah today, there was a commandment to read the Torah every seven years that they, they read it, even in the wilderness, saying that the Torah existed before the Torah even was concluded. So it's essentially the commandments within the Torah. So that's the only thing we really see from God. What's up, Rabbi? Because I know some Orthodox rabbis do hold to the notion that the Mishnah and the teachings and the explanations and so forth was also given on Mount Sinai. All right, I don't believe that. I don't believe that. Okay. Although I believe in the oral law. But I believe it in the way Maimonides tells us that, that it stems from the Torah itself. Because God tells us in Deuteronomy chapter 17 that in all areas of dispute, we go to the place that God will choose. That he chose many places. Uh, Jerusalem was the last one. Um, uh, I guess technically Yavne was the last one. And what? What? For what? For adjudication. The shuftim, the ability for them to adjudicate. Yeah, I don't know. Play this. Let's see. All right. Yo, what's up, brother? Okay, that's fine. Yeah. So, um, you can believe in the oral law and not believe that it was given to Moses on Mount Sinai. That's that's also just a midrash that people ran with, and they think that if you deny that, you're denying the oral law. But that's not. That's yeah, not. Isn't it? Wasn't it? Um, I forgot which who had said it. I think it was my money that said that if you do reject the Nigerian interpretation, that um. It's interesting. No, so there is, there is, like Maimonides does say this. It's in the second or third chapter of Hulhas Mamun. He says that those who say that the oral law is not divine, right? Now, the problem is if, it, if you read that alone, 
then you think that he's talking about people who 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 say basically what I'm saying. And in the Hilchos Yesoda Torah, that he tells you how he defines oral law. So he says oral law are only the interpretations to the commandments. But 98, 95% of what we call the oral law are like Takanas and Gezeiras. Like, for example, Purim. You know, Purim is part of the oral law, but it, like Purim is not an interpretation of any biblical verse. So these laws are for sure man-made, and every rabbi would have to acknowledge that they're man-made. The question is, there are some laws that are direct interpretations to, to biblical mitzvot. You know, for example, Shabbat. How do you keep Shabbat? So there has to be some, some consensus on how to keep it because there's a death penalty for breaking it. How do you establish months? There has to be some consensus on how we establish months because everything is built about like these festivals and, 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 um, and what we have to do on them. So then it led many, like Maimonides, to believe that these interpretations, at least these interpretations, must have been given to Moses at Mount Sinai. All right? That I'm not also you know, fully convinced of, but that's what he meant, essentially. I mean, not... Like, yeah, well, give me an example of an adjustment. Oh, all right. So that's okay. Wait, wait, wait. Okay, so authoritative biblical interpretations have nothing to do with Jewish rulings that have nothing to do with the Torah. For example, there's what's called takanot. You know, so a takana is a positive rabbinic commandment. A gezerah is a negative rabbinic commandment. A minhag from the time of, of the sages, of the Sanhedrin, is, is a custom that they ratified and made into law. This is completely different than what we call midrashe halacha, which means, well, the word midrash really means from the Torah. Midrash, from the drash. So it's like you're extracting laws from the Torah itself, how can we translate a mitzvah into its its uh, practical component, which we consider halakha? So that's only a handful of laws that really don't change, right? Um, yeah, those don't change. In terms of women being rabbis, I'm against women being rabbis. However, technically, a woman is allowed to be a rabbi because every rabbi today is fake. Rabbi, I got a question. Rabbi, I got a question. Oh, wait, 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 wait. Whatever God gave, whatever God gave is, is completely authoritative, but we should alter that and it's still... I get it, I get it. Hold on, there's someone in the chat oh, yeah. who, like, his name is Mr. Litvin, who just comes on here and insults and doesn't have the guts to come here and have a dialogue with me. Okay, like, and I hope he heard me say that. Oh, well, he's, like, he's asked the rabbi. Yeah, that's crazy. Yeah. Hey, that's what it is, bro. What's oh. up, Brady? How you doing? God bless, bro. Hey, how are you? How are you? Good, man. Good. Just here trying to, you know, bring a uh, friend, Rabbi uh, Asher, here out of Orthodox Judaism, so you can see that uh, Jesus is Yahweh. <laughs> oh well, I don't. I don't. Uh, I mean, I'm pretty firm in my Orthodoxy. The thing is, most of the attacks you're going to have on Orthodoxy, I don't consider true Orthodoxy. Um. Yeah. So and. Yeah, so in terms of women being rabbis, every rabbi today, including myself, is a fake rabbi. Every rabbi. Because the smicha we have nowadays was invented in 1535 in Sfat by this rabbi called the Mari Beirab. They, they, they instituted this ceremonial smicha. They really did an, a, a serious attempt to try to recreate it, at least according to the Rambam, but the Rambam says it seems to me. But look at this guy. George is not Orthodox. Jorge. Right? I mean, this guy's supposed to be a rabbi. Anyways. I don't know if I should block him because I want him to listen to what I have to say. Yeah, you should come up and stop. What's interesting, he has, he has asked Rabbi Lippin Day, like on, uh, like as live. Does he interact or does he just say, ask me questions and I'm on a log? Yeah, yeah. No, it's a joke. Oh, I'm not sure if he interacts. I don't know if he interacts. Um, but, but regardless, yes. So, I mean, the smicha we have today is not real smicha. Um, 
rabbis only have as much power as their communities give them. So if a woman wants to become a rabbi, which I mean, there was this guy named Avi Weiss who gave smicha to one lady, I think her name was Sarah Horowitz. I think she took the title rabbah. It technically doesn't violate any halakha. For sure, women could not sit on the Sanhedrin, 100%. All right, uh, but in terms of a, I think that whenever you introduce female clergy, it pushes the men away. Because uh, men will not, will not, seek instruction for women, at least not not masculine men, the ones who actually need most of the help, right, uh, to control their predatory nature. So um, can they become rabbis? Yes, they could. Is it a good idea? No, I, mean, I don't think it is from a personal perspective. But there's rabbis also like Ramosha Pais. What? Yeah, I said, I don't think you see that in the Torah either, though, like that, that idea. But it's also not limited in the Torah to say that it can't happen, right? Um, so that they can't be so uh right well the Torah doesn't say that it that that only men could sit uh it's interesting i don't know i mean clearly the word sanhedrin doesn't appear in the Torah, but in terms of the priesthood and being a rabbi is, is, is completely two different um, offices right correct although a priest could be a rabbi well the term rabbi is probably not the right word the word shofet judge is really what we call rabbis today from a Talmudic perspective. Every person who had the title rabbi in the Talmud was a judge to some extent, right? I mean, they sat, at, they sat on the Sanhedrin. Um, not everyone on the Sanhedrin technically had to have smicha. Uh, so they could offer their vote. And um, anyways, yeah, you know, so the proper term is judge. Like we just use the term rabbi because we use it, but it's fine. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's a loose term. Yeah, that's fair. But yeah, I mean, just going even back to the original point, I think um, I think the Torah does offer like a pretty clear verbatim explanation regarding what God is. Um, I think it's like I said when we yeah, get to second, second, we see that idea just being rejected, so that the Christians don't have a premise for their for for Jesus, because it, it's not it wasn't a heresy of all that regarding some of these ideas, right? So it, it, like heresy doesn't exist in Judaism. I mean, to be honest, heresy doesn't exist. All right. I mean, at first, it, it rarely appears in the Mishnah. In terms of min, uh, when you hear the word min in the Mishnah, it's dealing with like the Arba meaning, like the four species, like an actual species, not a like a sectarian. The reason why, that the bulk of it appears in Talmud Bavli, mainly Talmud Bavli. Being a heretic doesn't really meet... Well, there's I, no I, halachic status of a heretic. There's a mumer lechachis. Well... There's a Zakin Mamre, essentially, in terms of halakha, which means a religious elder, uh, a member of the court who in some way knows what the law is and instructs other people to do the opposite. In terms of adjudicating people for what they believe, according to halakha, that does not exist. There are no tests of, of what you happen to believe or not believe in Judaism. There are no religious tests. There are practical tests. If you break Shabbat, like if, if, if you eat Hametz and Pesach, <coughs> well, this they can adjudicate you for. How can someone wait, adjudicate wait. you for what you happen not to be convinced of? I got a question. Only a cruel God would operate like this. However, if you want to live in the land, keep them its vote. Okay, uh, and and whatever. If you have doubt, like everyone else doubts, I'm pretty sure God takes that in, I mean, into consideration. But the notion of that every rabbi nowadays, if they don't like you, they call you a heretic. This is I won't. Yo, leave. what's up, Rabba? How are you? Guys, so I mean, it's such a simpy move, you know. I mean, like, I don't even know, like, I don't go on to his live, and and his, I mean, not that it, it just I want him to stay because I want people to see the the like the childish behavior of this guy, right? I mean, wait, 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 can you hear me? Himself, what's the big deal? Rabbis from every stream of Judaism reject his teachings. Come on, man, you know, anyways, it just sounds silly. What's up, bro? What's up? What's up? Yeah. Can you hear me? No, he's Chabad. I mean, this guy's Chabad. You know, so in terms of Chabad, Chabad is for sure the black sheep of Orthodoxy, for sure. What? Yeah. No. Well, I mean, even apart from that, and my kid goes to Chabad. You know, I mean, my kid. Here, look it up. I mean, the guy who tells everyone I'm not Jewish. I mean, I have my kid in LEC here in South Florida. Okay. I mean, it's 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 ask around, and I'm I'm all for being docs. I don't I don't hide behind, you know, whatever insults. But fine. Yeah. So I mean, Chabad is essentially the black sheep of Orthodoxy. They really don't have 
I actually feel more comfortable like in I mean Chabad synagogues because I believe they're less. Although my biggest haters, from this individual to like Rabbi Wait, Yossi, Kor, uh, have been mainly Chabad. I, I I don't know why, but most and most Chabad synagogues are pretty open. Yeah. That's what I think also. I mean, yeah. it's because they feel that um, they're like, who are you to educate us? But there are some guys on TikTok with purple hair and stuff like that. And nobody. Free Palestine. I mean, teaching the most. Yeah, yeah. And it's. Free Palestine. Your hair is, you know, but assuming like if you have purple hair. Free I mean, Palestine. That like your, your views are typically going to be right wing. But um, yeah, it's so silly. It's so, it's so silly. Anyways. I mean, I love to dialogue and I love to learn. And 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 there's some things yeah. that I like, dig my heels into the ground and for sure I don't budge. But in terms of what you happen to be convinced of, right? I mean, if you believe that that I care about what makes the world a better place, and I think more Torah, like Torah observance, accomplishes that. That's it. it. It it that's it. You know, if I'm gonna Free judge Palestine. someone's character on who's better and who's worse in terms of groups. I'm going to determine that by who keeps more mitzvot. Do Messianic Jews keep more mitzvot than Reform well, Jews? One hundred percent. What does it mean? Uh, hold on. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. I think the idea of somebody being more Jewish based off of the day. Hello. Here, Steve. Go ahead. Hello. I got a question. Oh, yeah, I think there's something wrong with my YouTube. Hold on. Hold on. Let me see. So try again, Steve. Can you hear me now? Oh, there's something wrong with that. Ah, hold on, hold on. How can I? How can I do this? Hmm. Mm -hmm. How can I? Oh, I. I know, I know, I know, I know, I know. Hold on, one second, guys. This is one. All right, go for it. Hello, hello. Can you hear me? Hi, hi. Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. Like this. I mean, I got this new adapter for his camera to screw everything up. Oh, so, so the rabbi you've been talking to is Shabbat Habad? No, no. Uh, it's, it's, it's some rabbi in the text who's insulting me. His name is Rabbi Litvin, people. Litvin. Yes, it's Letoelet in this case. So go, go ahead. Well, he should know that if you insult somebody in a false manner, it's, a, it's an evil act. A yeah, act. no. So his response to that, because I brought that up to him, he says, well, he doesn't consider me Jewish. And there's this notion of Amitecha. Well, it doesn't matter if you're Jewish or not. You're still human. Uh, we're not according to Chabad. I mean, so, I mean, would they believe that you're allowed to speak evil things about non-Jews, which is actually not what that means. In terms of being a Rechel, like Rechilut, I think the Ramam understands that you don't have, that you're not supposed to, I mean, like speak gossip on anyone, Stam. Yeah. For yeah, some reason, yeah, modern day people justified in saying that you're allowed to say it on Gentiles, which makes us look terrible. What's considered gossip? Well, it it's interesting. All right, so this is a different discussion. So, but Lush and Hard doesn't appear in the Torah like this. Yeah, Motzeh Shemer also doesn't appear in the Torah. Like the term that appears in the Torah for evil speech is Rechilut. You know, so Rechilut just means it says don't be in English. You translate it into English, it says don't be a, a tail bearer amongst your people. Well, then don't so, even tell the truth, right? Uh, well, so they say, like the modern day, I mean, Shmer Salashon says that if it's true, it's Motzah Shem. No, no, if it's true, it's Lashon Hara. If it's not true, it's Motzah Shemra. Um, but this doesn't appear in, like in the Talmud like this, it doesn't appear in Mishneh Torah. In Mishneh Torah, like in Mishneh Torah like I believe it's just two chapters of, like, of Hilchus Deus to deal with Rechilut, what we call Lashon Hara. Now, like if you ever seen like the Hafez Chaim or Shmir Salah and it's a huge book, right, with a lot of of information just on how, like how to speak when it never appears like this in codified sources of halacha, right? I mean, it's very small, which leads us to believe that common sense plays a big part on what we should say and what we shouldn't say about other people. The reason why I think it's important to mention this is because under this notion of not speaking lush and hara, there's a lot of people who don't report crimes especially for some reason against kids because they feel that uh, if the well, person that chooses... also a crime, isn't it? Not to no, report a crime legally. Well, you mean like Leif Naver? Like, uh, yeah, let anyway. You, let your brother, like, die or idle? No, I get it, you know, but, I mean, the Chafetz says that if the person did chuva, then you can't 
report him to the authorities, which is kind of silly. That's oh weird. my gosh, why this guy? Okay, Zev, calling out the danger to the community like Jorge slash Asher is not Lush and Hora. Hold on, I can't believe this. Well, I can't. I can't even see him writing. Why doesn't he just pull up and have a debate? I don't think this is him. It can't be. I mean, it's just it sounds too childish. I mean, but even for him. So I mean, I, 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 I'll be done with and assume that it's. I don't think I don't think our actual rabbi would actually be this dense, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Anyways, fine. All right, Renegade, what's up? Go for it. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Another, another thing that I was interested in that I found in the Torah um, was the brush, the brush plate for the Hedekho Kohenim. For the Hoshim Mishpach. Yeah. You. And the, Ram, the Rambam offers an idea and interpretation Ooh. of there potentially being names and not just one name that's within that brush plate. So, uh, like, I mean, if we're holding to the notion that God is just one singular deity, why did then why then does the Ramban offer an idea that there's multiple names within that um, that breastplate for God's uh, nature? So there's two different things. I mean, there's, there's the Hoshim Mishpat, and then there's the Urm Vatumim. You know, so now which one are you talking about? Uh, let me pull up the source. Too, sorry. Yeah, because the holy dice were in the breastplate. But they would take it out whenever I think the high priest wanted to know if, like, if they went to war. Um, but I, I don't. I mean, if the Rambam said it, I guess it's just his opinion. Whatever. I guess it's just his opinion. Uh, Michael, what's up, Michael? Michael Pearson. Oh wow! Oh, what? Hi, hi. Uh, long time listener, first time caller. All right. Well, welcome. Uh, Hey, yeah. Uh, just real quick, uh, what are your, what's your point of view, your thoughts on um, Jews uh, sitting and eating with non-Jews? I, I could tell you a story, but if not, I, what's your, what's your thoughts? All right. So the only prohibition that I'm familiar with was in terms of um, mixed marriages, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, assuming, but in Hebrew, we have this notion of there has to be a hashash, like some reasonable way. Uh, like to assume that if your son is is eating alongside the non-Jewish baker's daughter, that that's a possibility, uh, or eating in a restaurant with non-Jews, that he's going to end up marrying a non-Jew, then for sure it shouldn't be allowed. Clearly, now that's if you separate the world between the ethical and the unethical, assuming that these are non, like, evil individuals, and that and that not necessarily. Um, I don't know. You know, I mean, someone who's close to Torah, someone who could be maybe nudged the rest of the way. But there's no actual, actual prohibition like Stam that, that Jews they shouldn't eat in the vicinity of or in the same table as Gentiles. Yeah. Thank you. Very cool. But I know the New Testament for some reason mentions it. Interesting. But, uh, well, I'm interested in his story. What was his example? Oh, uh, uh, I, I'm a Jew by choice, and uh, I went to an event here that was hosted in town and uh, by the uh, more orthodox uh, Jews. And, um, and uh, you know, I sat down to eat, and we're just, hi, and, you know, nice to meet you, chit-chat. And they're like, oh, what's your last name? And then you know, I gave them my last name, which does not sound Jewish, of course. And they, uh, the family got up and moved to another table. No, come on. No, I yeah. Don't and those must it's have been... All right, what's the one Pardon me. Where? Uh, pardon me. What did you say? No. Oh. no. What city were you in? Uh, Columbus, Ohio. Ohio. Yep. Yep. Huh. Yep. So. Hey, yeah, that's where Rod Parsley's from. Oh wow! Yeah, yeah. yeah he's a big name here. Yeah. Every remnant. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So yeah, that was it. So I was just kind of like, uh, uh, just yeah. So just by my last name, they. Eh? decided to move and sit that's so else. weird i mean maybe yeah it was it feels like a, like not, i'm not gonna say it wait can you guys hear me yeah 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 it feels like you know like the civil rights era kind of like <laughs> feeling that's not common i'll tell you it's not common yeah that, it was that, my only my only experience yeah, everyone maybe else you had heard. bad bo or something <laughs> you know? could have been yeah i'm gonna give them the benefit yeah. of the doubt can right you, right thanks again for answering my question appreciate it happy to be here all right, so five minutes. You, five minutes. I have to go right. You can't, you can't um, eat at a, a non-Jew's home, correct? I mean, you can't eat their food, but what constitutes a non-Jew's home? Like a property owned by a non-Jew? No, let's say for example. I mean, 
Yeah, is it common for, kosher, maybe? Yeah, is it common for a Jew to go over a non Jew's home? To eat, no. <laughs> or even yeah. just to have coffee. Oh no, that's fine. That's fine. I mean it depends. What do you mean? I mean served like what? You know, like they bought coffee from somewhere like and they were drinking it there or or it was Well, like, then the, the question is problematic about the dishes, no? Oh yeah, no, for sure. But if they both walk in with Starbucks coffee like into the person's house, they're allowed to drink it together. But yeah, I mean kosher is an issue. Um yeah, yeah. I mean a Gentile could technically cook for a non Jew, I mean for a born Jew. Right in like under the auspices of like of the Jew, like um, if it's not, but this is notion of all um, the malachim that if it's not very extravagant, extravagant food or food that a king wouldn't eat, then a gentile could cook it for you under your auspices. But that's that's the only leniency we have. Yeah, I mean outside of pospalter, which is bread that that. Uh, like could be made by Gentiles on the industry level. Yeah, no, but actual just eating with a like a a uh, Gentile, like I don't know, like you're in Disney World and the Jews they bring a picnic basket and you bring a picnic basket. There's something wrong with that. I have two questions related. What what's your position on the 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 goal of Gemara? All right. Are you distinguishing Gemara like from the Mishnah? Yeah, so G G Gemara in in terms of commentary on on passages. No, just just general commentary. So I'll give you an example that I've read. Um, I was reading um, Bereshit, uh, twelve verse three, and then you know, in Safari, you could click on the uh, the passages, and it says the Talmud, and I read uh, Yavam Yavamot. And Eliezer's commentary on Genesis twelve three, but it was it was in the Talmud, the Babylonian Talmud. No, All right. So when they say Gemara, which are essentially the words of the Amorayim, they're not commenting on the Torah. They may give a commentary to the Torah, but that's not their their great contribution. The reason they're important to us is because they have the closest connection to the rabbis who actually had authority to make legal decisions, which are those that we call Tanaim. So the Amorayim say outlandish things sometimes that, that sort of fall on deaf ears. So we have this notion that we don't hold by this or that medrash or this or that agatha. So they're important to us because they're the direct connection to the Tanaim, but only regarding <clears throat> legal issues, not on anything metaphysical, and for sure not on any type of interpretation of a Torah verse. They could interpret it. But if an Amara says something, it doesn't automatically become binding, like as if the Sanhedrin rules it into existence. So that's the distinction. Only because it appears in the Talmud doesn't make it authoritative. Yeah, know? yeah, I understand. The interesting thing is, I'm sure you're familiar with that, um, the concept of being grafted in. Uh, and speaking of what that guy was talking about, mixed marriages and all that, um, Rabbi Eliezer uh, basically says, um, that uh, Genesis twelve three is in reference to the grafting in of Ruth. I thought it was in, that was interesting. All right. I mean, it doesn't make it any more authoritative than if you, I mean, came up with that connection, and that may get people upset. But it's true. I mean, Amoraim didn't have smicha. There was one Amara. I think uh, Rav Zera became Rabbi Zera. Uh, but for the most part, they were just commenting on the Amara, uh, like on the Tanaim, or even challenging them. With other Tanaic statements that didn't appear in the Mishnah called called Braitot. But um yeah, that's pretty much it. Is that so so in terms of grafting in, do you think it's something similar to um his interpretation is something similar that obviously back then they didn't have formal conversion, and so somehow Ruth, you know, you know, David was descended from Ruth. Right. And you know she was not Hebrew. Right, that's a stretch. You know, so now you're going to connect it to Jesus because he's a, well, they're both related to Jesus. Um, no, but I mean Paul talks about being grafted in, and then then the Gentiles don't need to convert that they're grafted into the promise, right? You know, you're familiar with that, correct? Yeah. Remember. Okay. And then it's interesting that Eliezer is basically using a specific word in in Mishnaic Hebrew. Stretch. stretch. I mean, I have no issue. 
No, it's right there. He says it. Look, no. I, re I could read it to you. I understand, but it's a stretch, you know, for you to say just because the same word is used in English, right? Both by by Paul and Rabbi Eliezer that they're talking about the same thing. But no, in Hebrew. It, okay, let me read it to you real quick. It says uh, Eliezer expounded what is meant by we the verse. Any Pauline writings in Hebrew. What? We don't have any Pauline writings in Hebrew. No, I'm reading you Eliezer. I know, but you're saying that it's the same word used by Paul. Well, no, it makes sense when I read it. <laughs> it's, don't it says, I don't allow anyone to read text. This is silly, right? I'm not disagreeing. I'm not saying you're wrong. I'm just saying it's a little bit of a stretch to in some way because he uses the word grafts it into in some way be alluding to Jesus to some extent that if an Orthodox Jew, I mean, was said. No, no, I'm not even talking about anything like that. I'm talking about and obviously in his context, he's saying the grafting is in, no, no, in no. terms of roof. Uh, the Moabitess and Nama, the Ammonitess. Okay. And how is it that, you know, they're forbidden to enter in the, the uh, congregation, yet, you know, these are, uh, you know, David descends from them. In other words, the, the Gentiles are somehow grafted in. All right. Right? Okay. No, okay. But so they're. Yeah, the that's. Yep. Wait, hold on. I mean, the you, have a, you have a mode 63. Stop, stop, stop. But the reason it mentions Ruth and Nama is that Nama was from Ammon and Ruth was from Moab. And those are the two uh, like nations that it says that they should never enter the congregation of Israel. Correct. Right? I mean, that's the reason it's mentioning it. I've been mean, tying it to the New Testament is a bit of a stretch. No, I mean, no, I, you, you brought that up. I didn't bring that up. But you mentioned Paul. Because it's a similar concept, the grafting in. This is the but same, this is the same up. verse. Huh? It's not the a same verse that he quotes. Only because you use the word grafting in doesn't mean that they're talking about the same thing. Grafted in, you could say conversion is a form of grafting in. Essentially, they both converted. So, I mean, who cares? No, that's the point. It's not a point. It's a it's a connection you're trying to make that's not literally there. Say you see it, but you're saying no, like, no. It if you read, it. if you read, you have a oh, mod sixty three a. I'm not going to read it because you told me not to read it. But when you read it, he's okay. talking about how the how the nations. All nations are grafted in, not just those two. Okay. You do make a distinction between a statement in the Torah and a statement like uttered by a rabbi, right? So, the, I mean, the way I would see it is like you mentioned earlier that um, obviously um, the earliest people that received the tradition are more authoritative. No, I didn't say that. I mean, yeah, I you did. I am authoritative. I mean, not necessarily because you're you're older, but that you're more authoritative. I mean, I don't believe it. Atana. Yeah, no, Tanaim are more authoritative, not interpreting Torah, by the way, in voting things into existence. Oh, no, but, no, I'm not saying voting things into existence, but I'm saying the tradition that they received on interpretation of a verse. No, no, not at all. No, no. No, no that, so that was my question. So why would why would it be recorded in, in the Babylonian Talmud to begin with the bulk of of what's in the babylonian talmud is essentially disposable i mean it's midrash in the sense that it doesn't affect how we live our daily life as a jew i mean because someone's going to say i mean probably my hater in the comment oh you're saying that that the, the words of the mri are disposable anything that's not from a prescriptive uh perspective is essentially agada that's it if it's not telling you to do something it's describing an idea that that is not necessarily bind that there's no obligation necessarily to believe it that's it like, what we have to do is halaha la mase like what you do like not, yeah i understand not, uh, yeah. was that eliezer a tana or was he I'm, I'm... That, i mean it depends which eliezer i mean it's rabbi eliezer ben Horkinus. yes i mean he was yeah. a tana and he was uh from beit shammai so right it's it's funny most most jews don't i, I think there's only 18 things 18 or 14 things that that Beit Shammai got over Beit Hillel in terms of that we hold by nowadays halakhically, right? Uh, but anyways, but yeah. he says all. But no, my point was not to connect it to to uh, Yeshua or anything like that. My point was that it says that all the nations will be blessed. That so that's the meaning why, of the verse. This is why I think messianics have a threshold on how educated they can be, because they get stuck so much on first stage thinking. How is that first stage thinking? I'm, I'm, I'm asking you Genesis 12, 3, that I didn't write I mean, I would have Eliezer's commentary. This, you know, instead of going down a rabbit hole that leads essentially nowhere. 
right? No, it's nothing about the Mishnaic Hebrew with Benabarechu being a reference to intermingling or to graph from Mavri. Okay, but it's no, not, okay. So being that we don't have Hebrew writings of Paul, we don't know what word he may have used. I didn't mention Paul. I mentioned so that graph specific. Graph to be conversion, right? I mean, why do they have to like tie into Gentiles coming into the Jewish people like via because, some sort of human sacrifice? Because literally the whole world would have to convert into Orthodox Judaism. Okay. That's what the point is. But that that's principle pre-existed. Okay. That principle existed in Masechet, in Masechet, Barazo, Masechet Brachot. It says that the whole world is going to convert to Judaism. Right? It makes a statement. But that doesn't mean that someone could say, oh, this is a reference to Gentiles coming in the like in the future via Yeshua. You know, like no, but you I didn't mention that. That no, honestly, Asher, I didn't mention that. Into the New that, Testament, you know, it, you okay, so you know where I come from, but then you're honesty. you're you're no, taking know. you're taking where I come from and you're just by me making a statement, you're saying well, that's where I'm going, but that's not where I'm going. Okay. No, because it's deceptive from the beginning. Like it's you, not deceptive. It's deceptive because people here don't know who you are. Like if you would pretty much say, "I'm trying to in some way validate." No, what no, no. You did, okay, and the graph. But you mentioned it. I didn't. Early rabbinic thought of in some way in in, in one fail swoop all Gentiles via faith being grafted into Israel. Okay. This never crossed. No, but that's what rabbi. that's what you're saying, Asher. Look. um, that's like me accusing you like it's your radical. hater. No, That's no. like me accusing you like your haters accuse you of, of being a, a Freemason and, and converting everybody to Freemasonry. Okay, I would well, never assume that. True. I mean, huh? I am a Freemason. I don't convert anyone to Freemasonry, but you are a Messianic. Okay. And I'm not a Messianic. No, no. Nope. Okay. Did you mention Paul? No, you mentioned Paul. <laughs> you mentioned Paul. No, okay. I didn't rewind it back. But my point is this. And, 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 and look. I'm I'm trying to uh, just be straight to the text. Eliezer is saying oh, that word. Okay. Killer, we're gonna move forward. We're gonna move forward. Well, why do you back? You're like, like, you're like you don't. Yeah, we're going in circles. We're ready. No, going. you're going in circles. There's no problem. You're repeating it. You know, by the simple fact that you're gonna repeat the same thing that you just uttered for the last 15 minutes means that you just want more airtime. No, no, no. I you asked you. So I don't think the average person could. Like, could make the direct connection. Could there be a connection from a devotional perspective? Maybe, right? But you're saying, like, no, 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 there's something there. There's, not, there's nothing there. No, that wasn't. So my question was, because you believe something similar, that the nations do not have to convert as long as they keep Torah. I was trying to... Wait, 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 wait. Who, said that? who said that? Isn't part of your belief that um, you don't... It's a good idea if people convert to Judaism, yeah. but you're not you're not saying that they have to. That oh, wait, you would wait. rather people just observe Torah. No. You you want people to convert, yeah, but you would rather people convert to, uh, observe Torah. Yes, I rather everyone observe Torah. However, to the only way to properly worship God is essentially to convert to Judaism. Now, does that mean going through your local Beit Din and being mistreated? No, that's not what it means. But entering the covenant committing yourself to keep Torah, even if I have to convert you, that's what you have to do. You know, why? Because making the world a better place is essentially a team effort. So you must do it. If people can't do that, would I want kids to still honor their parents and, and not steal from wait, each wait, other? Wait, 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 hold on. What, can you clarify, con you said that they have, everybody has to convert? Convert, yeah. Wait, so you're saying that everybody has to convert? Yes, yes, essentially. No, Everything. you you haven't said that before. I've always said that. Can someone not convert and still do good on this planet by keeping mitzvot? 100%. I mean, I hope that the age group in Gaza starts keeping the proper midot tomorrow. Right? How can, so, you, how can you justify that? So, for example, okay, so just, just using Torah. I can't trust the man who does not commit himself to Torah observance. That's what covenant means. It's an right. agreement that you have. This right. notion that I'm going to pick and choose how I worship God and how I serve my fellow man, okay, doesn't yield the results that we could have if someone actually commits to something. And men love to commit to things. What does it have to do with rit a ritual procedure? The ritual procedure is nothing but an announcement that you are aligning yourself 
with the people of Israel. It's an announcement. Whenever you keep laws, whenever you do the right thing, you're saying it, I'm doing it in behalf of Israel and the philosophy we keep. That's why it's important. So other people could join this group. This, this notion that I'm going to retire into piety and just be ethical on my own doesn't do as much good. So what about Abraham? Abraham. So, so what about Abraham and everybody that was not on Mount Sinai? There's, there's, there's a total of seven people. On this no, planet. no, just answer that question. Just answer that question. Okay, okay. I'm, because I'm this is what you do to me. <laughs> there's tons of people who want to talk and you keep on. No, because I, I mean, I, I'm trying to have an honest conversation. Other people want to talk. All right. It's okay. I mean, I dropped them. <laughs> okay, I dropped so them. Fine. Since you kind of went into that, I wanted to kind of correct something that it's a notion that, well, you want Christians to keep Torah because it would be better, but that's not, there's this, you kind of sound like a Hebrew Israelite. It's this notion of like, we're in disobedience because we believe Christ fulfilled the law. In Christianity, we believe in going higher. And let me give you an example. So when, the, the, the law says thou shalt not commit adultery, right? But then Jesus said, if you look on a woman to lust after her, you've already committed it. So it's like obedience, not obedience. It's it's an understanding of not doing it, just not physically, but not doing it mentally and eternally. Um, another example, um, this is, is something that says like, you know, honor your mother and father. But then after that, it says also parents, provoke not your children to wrath, lest they be discouraged. That's not in the law. The, the okay, first part is okay. the second part, is it? But now it's establishing certain boundaries between in the relationship between parents. So Christ actually magnified the law. He brought it. I get it. I get it. I get it. Higher. All right. So the notion that Christians like are like you know drunken, stealing, non-honoring parent people because we believe Christ fulfilled the law. That's not what it is. We believe we're living a holy life. I know, I we know. Don't believe we're justified by the law. I get it. All right, so what's your criteria for the laws you choose to keep and the ones you disregard? It's not about a choose to keep. There are still certain standards of holiness in Christianity, right? So we don't believe in fornication. We don't believe in stealing. We don't believe in adultery. We believe in holiness. But what's your criteria? You know, for wait, wait, wait. wait. So the spirit of Christ doesn't lead you to sin. How do you know that? So how, wait, wait. Look, I'm, I'm getting to it. So do we? Can we look and see? Okay, am I being deceived into doing something? Oh, okay, I'm honoring my mother, and my father, but it's not for righteousness. And let me I get it. I know. Yep, yeah, you're preaching right now. I mean, I asked no, you no, for no, a criteria. You don't have no, a criteria. No, 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 no. I can't trust someone. I mean, I can't trust someone who doesn't have a criteria for how they behave. This notion that the spirit will make sure. So what's the criteria? You can't say the Holy Spirit. Well, the criteria is God's word. It's still the Bible. Yeah, but you said that you don't that you're not bound to keep God's word. No, 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 no. You're misunderstanding what I'm saying. It says we're not justified by the keeping of the law. We're justified through Christ. But do you have to keep justified for salvation? However, justify. Right. Do you but feel bound to keep the law? Lie, cheat, and steal as Christian. Do you okay, feel bound? Do, 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 do you mind if I answer that question? No, 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 no. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. No, no. So let me give you, Rabbi. Just give you an example. So when Joseph resisted Potiphar's wife, yeah. how did he know not to commit that sin? This is before the Torah was given. Okay. Huh? Uh, because everyone is born with the basic sense of morality, right? And for sure, the right. early patriarchs weren't okay. judged by the same standard. Then the later Israelites were were but were, were my drift, no, I don't. He was, well, no, no, he was so either were Christians though, right? So he, sure. wait, wait, okay. Right, so he was wait. Let me get this one point, and I'm gonna let let somebody just go. So Joseph was able not to commit sexual sin with Potiphar's for his wife, and the law at Sinai was not given. Joseph had a relationship with God, which will lead you to holiness. He didn't have the Ten Commandments. The standards him, don't do this, don't do that. Were elevated. He resists, my point is he resists okay. sexual sin I got it. for the law. Okay. Can we agree on that? Right. And then, I mean, he also didn't honor his parents and like, mistreated his older brothers. Next. Okay. I mean, I heard what you had to say. Now, <laughs> let me talk to Courtney okay. here. Okay. So, Courtney, Gentiles must keep the ethical portions of the law in order to in some way be tolerated by a good God. That's my personal opinion. The Torah opinion, there is no way a Gentile could commune with a good God unless he keeps all the Torah. 
That's a Torah opinion. There's no notion of a righteous Gentile after the Torah was given. Now, I know that's different from what many rabbis may teach, but the Torah does not speak about a fourth holy house of Israel, right? Or a fourth holy house that's tolerated in any way under the Godhead. It's either full Torah observance or nothing. Now, what are you, what right. are you talking about the Godhead for in light of Torah observance? No, oh God, God, you know what I mean. You said Godhead for Godhead is a Christian concept, Asher. Okay, it's not true. You know, in Kabbalah, you know, the Atsilut is called the no, also Godhead. Too, Fine, right? whatever. Okay. So, I mean, just to make that clear, because, like, I mean, Courtney's under the impression that I believe, like, most people does. Well, she knows, I guess I don't, All right? That, uh, oh, that. On. I've known you for, like, how many years? Too long. Anyways, <laughs> Gentiles, if they want a relationship with God, right, a true, proper relationship with God must become Jewish. They must become Jewish. Okay, now, like, could you strive to make your community better by implementing the, the ethical portions in the law? 100%. But this idea that people could walk around choosing how they want to worship God, this doesn't exist in the Torah. I understand if you keep the Sheva Mitzvot to Noach, you'll be the, one of the righteous of the nations. I get that Midrash. However, that does not appear in the Torah. Yeah, but Rabbi, what about Bilam? So Bilam was a wicked individual, and it doesn't say that God was pleased with him in any way. So to go ahead and build this notion that God was in any way happy with Bilam or we should strive to be like Bilam, you know, I don't even know, like, how that even comes into play. Yeah, but he wasn't wicked the entire time. Bad it doesn't God. say that he did tshuva. You mean the false prophet? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, my God. Anyways, no. that, I mean, that for sure is a red herring. I mean, I really wish that the story of Bilam was not in the Torah because it's, like, it is very confusing. Just real quick, where do you get this notion that Gentiles need to become Jewish to love God? Because the Torah... The oh, no, you can love God. Is... Wait, wait, hold on. So you can love God, like, also by picking and choosing like, what laws you want to keep and, like, the tenets of your new religion, right? I mean, you could love God. Picking and choosing. Why? What do you mean? I mean, according to the Torah, yeah. the, the way you serve God is by keeping his... Is, is only by keeping his commandments. And God didn't distinguish between commandments. Yes, he did. Okay, go ahead. Okay, so he doesn't directly distinguish between the moral law, the civil law, and the um, uh, ceremonial law. However, we find within the prophets that we but see... But not in the Torah. I said the Torah. The I Torah. Say, come on, you keep moving the goal. Not the, I said the Torah so from that, the beginning. No one in the Torah... You're talking about Christians. Yes, no, no, no. no okay, so no one in the Torah... Like you're I understand, Which, you know, so but, but you were talking to me that when you said that Gentiles don't have to keep the Torah. Okay, it's true. Jews right. don't have to keep the Torah. No one has to do anything in this world. However, if you want to claim to worship God properly, and to worship means to serve, the way we serve God is only by keeping his mitzvot. You can't, this notion that God is pleased with Gentiles who could essentially pick seven laws, and I don't know how that makes anyone righteous on this planet, right? By only seven laws, even, you know, heathens keep more, Right. That does not make them anyway holy or connected to God. You know, I mean, it can make them better people, essentially, like if you honor your parents. Uh, so how was Abraham in the before the Torah? And Joseph right that's before, before the Torah was given. Exactly. Okay. I'm sure. I'm sure. I'm sure. Uh, hold on. Listen, you said Christians. Christians believe in more than just the Torah. So every time I get closer to it, you know, exposing that aspect of what Christians believe, which is all of Tanakh plus the New Testament, you say, no, I just mean the Torah. Our religion and our belief is not based solely just in the Torah. We believe in the writings and the prophets, and we see in the writings and the prophets and elsewhere no, I that Hashem never destroyed a nation for not keeping all of the mitzvot, mm -hmm. that Jews were incumbent to, to believe. This is just the way that it is. So here's the difference, okay? According to our beliefs, when Jesus was asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He says, you know the commands, and he quotes the bottom half of the Big Ten. So these are moral aspects that can be incumbent upon. I get it. Yeah, but this is a Jewish no show. Matter, hold on, hold on, hold on. No so, matter what. I'm giving you the so, Jewish Torah perspective. I understand that you're fully justified in your statements because you're speaking from a Christian perspective. Okay, that's fine. According to the New Testament, there's more things that you must believe in that I don't have to believe in. According to the Torah, I'm just saying, according to the Torah, there is only one way 
to serve God. There's only one way. And that's... But the, but the Torah is specific to the Jewish people not, in and living around the nation, the lands that he gave, of okay. course. Like, okay. you can't so it still doesn't contradict my statement. It's the, it doesn't contradict my statement because God doesn't change. The idea that a prophet is no, going to institute a theological that, concept that doesn't appear in the Torah is nuance. I disagree with you. Okay, well, there we go. And I'll tell you why. That's our huge disagreement. No, I'll tell you why. What? No, I'll tell you why. So tell me. Because if it, if it is based, if the Torah command is, do you keep Shemitah? I mean, does anyone properly keep the Shemitah year do today? No. Well, first of all, I don't live in the land of Israel. Okay, so. All right, there you go. Okay. That's your answer. If you don't live in the land of Israel, then there are many commands within the Torah that are not binding to a person that lives outside the Torah. Oh, but that's so, not, that's what the Torah says. No, but the Torah and made he, leeway for that. No, he doesn't. He doesn't. Obviously, him. nobody no, keeps all. This is such a primitive argument. I'm pretty sure it's frustrating, Courtney, by the way. Oh, wait, 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 wait. Wait, hold on, hold on, hold on. No, guys, 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 guys. The 613 laws do exist in Torah. There's actually more than 613 laws. Okay. Yeah. No, we can't keep them, which, you know. Huh? Yeah, but the, okay. But anyway, it's not even about that, Asher. You know what I'm saying, like, right? You you can't. I understand your point, right? Your point is God only prescribed the Torah as the way to worship Him. I agree. Okay. However, when it comes down to living and working and being outside the land where right. God chose for His name, then yes, there are prescriptions that a Gentile does not have to keep. A Gentile does not have to keep to. Where not according to the right? Torah. Like yeah, but not according to the Torah. That, so that's that's my point. There's nothing to disagree so with. Christians, okay, so here my, my disagreement with and has been with you for this amount of time. You believe that Muslims have a different God, right? Correct. Because, or you believe that they worship falsely because they don't do what is prescribed in the Torah. Correct. But you don't think that Christians do, um, um, Messianics do. However, you say mainstream Christians are. Okay, the problem is, is you're basing this solely on the Torah rather than seeing that Gentiles, according to the whole of the Hebrew Bible, and even according to the actual physical first five books, the Torah, Torah law, were never ever told to worship exactly as a Jew unless they were joining themselves to the nation of Israel. Oh my gosh, God yes. never spoke. In the Torah, God never speaks after the Torah was given to any Gentile, you know, from an authoritative manner to do anything. OK, any Gentile who wasn't interested, by the way, because the mixed multitude and actually the Hebrews from that perspective were still Gentiles. And God was pleading with them to choose life. And, and by not choosing life, they'd be choosing a, like a, like an existence of, of death and cursing. This notion that only because of. Did you say that God never talked in the Torah? Didn't hear that, right? Yeah, so, no, I didn't what, say that. What did he say? I'm sorry. Say that again. Okay, God didn't speak directly to Gentiles after the Torah was given on a prescriptive way that he wants to be worshipped. There is no notion of Gentiles in the Torah, by the way. There's people in the covenant and people outside of the covenant. Okay, and if you were outside of the covenant, you were essentially lost. And Israel is supposed to be an example, a... a, a um, Mamlechet Kohanim, like a guiding example of like leadership to the nations, right? Has that, Israel ever been a regardless, I'm telling you what the Torah says. I mean, forget about yeah, Israel. I agree with that part, like, we're a bunch of communists and lefties, I, like 100%. Okay. But from a Torah perspective, I'm telling you what the Torah ideal, anything outside of that is adding to the Torah. That means the hyperbole, poetry, and symbolism that appears in the prophets, you don't understand properly. Why? Because it's contradicting the Torah. You're in some way saying that Gentiles could be adjudicated and, and validated in, in this way can when you, God only gave one standard. Genesis 3 8 means? Genesis 3 8? No, we don't want to get sidetracked. Yeah, this is a primitive Actually, argument. You're telling me? No, you're telling know. me? I don't understand. No, he's telling yeah. me he's an innocent. I, mean, yeah, I want to know what you think about Genesis 3 8. I know. No, yeah, but this is too primitive. No, no. That I don't understand? No, no, he didn't say that. He didn't say that. I mean, no, you, my, you, my dude. You, sir. Good sir. Oh, <laughs> yes, yes. I don't think that you properly understand. Yeah, hold on, hold on. I don't think that you, including and other people like you, woman, don't understand exactly the message that appears in the prophets. Why? Unless you believe the prophets are in some way disagreeing with the Torah. However, you're allowing yourself to view the Torah through the lenses of the prophets. When you, like, you shouldn't do that. The job of the prophet is only to bring you to the doorstep of Torah, and that's it. 
the notion that now Gentiles are prophesied to be grafted in, but they don't have to convert and all this stuff is, is, is conjecture. New stuff that doesn't appear anywhere in the Torah. Right. I mean, it's essentially new because it's not in the Torah, but the simple fact that you it believe. It appears in, in the Tanakh, in, the, in Jeremiah, where it says a new covenant. What do you have to say about that? He doesn't believe really in. I mean, did you just hear everything I just said? I want, oh, he doesn't. I, I, want, I want him to go to Genesis 3 verse 8. Oh. <laughs> yeah, yeah, wait, wait, wait. I just want him to clarify, Josh. I want him. All right. Okay. Yeah. Josh, okay. I'm going to make an attempt to explain Jeremiah to you. <laughs> Although Jeremiah can't change one, you know. By the simple fact that you think that Jeremiah is telling us that God is making an allowance for a new covenant, right? I mean, yes. like, assuming you believe covenant means Torah, right? Which is like probably like your first mistake, that God is changing from, or it, he's he's changing from the original game plan shows that you're violating the Torah from that perspective. Wait, 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 can I answer? Can I answer? Can I answer? Let me answer. 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 Wait, wait, Sean, please. No, wait, wait, wait. Okay. So every time Israel goes into exile, every time Israel goes into exile, it's because they broke the covenant with God. Every time Israel is brought back to the land, there's a new covenant made. So Jeremiah is speaking to Israel and Babylon, right? We have to understand these prophets chronologically, but we can't say that he's talking to us today. Wait, 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 wait. You know, so that covenant he's speaking about was already made with Israel and Israel already broke it. And now we're waiting for God to make another covenant with the Jewish people once we do no, tshuva. Wait, 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 can I answer you? No, there's nothing to answer because this is the only way it aligns with the Torah. To assume no, that... Doesn't, even Rashi doesn't give that I don't care what Rashi says. I'm telling you what the Torah says. Yeah, but he's more authoritative than you in terms of interpretation. Of the incorrect. Testament. Okay, incorrect. It doesn't matter what interpretation you give to the prophets if it's deviating any way from the Torah. Okay. Okay. Keon can go. Then I'm going to read Jeremiah 31. I must. Okay. No one's reading anything on this show. All right. Go ahead. When we're looking at the Torah, you're, I think you're you're basically presenting the Torah in a way that it wasn't given at that time at Mount Sinai with Moshe and Aaron. No. I mean, the Torah. The Torah. When even when you look at Numbers, um, it offered an idea that God could make amendments to that Torah, right? How? 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 Um, so, for example, like it's, it's, it talks about um, the genealogy is supposed to be like certain things are supposed to be only given to the son, and that God makes an adjustment within the Torah. Yeah, yeah, within the Torah. Yeah, right? and in the same in the Torah, in the same Torah, God says, "Now you can add or take away from these commandments." Well, he made an adjustment. He made an adjustment. So to that. Wait, hold on. Wait, hold on. What uh, so uh, trolling on YouTube. No, it's not YouTube. Yes, it's, it's TikTok. Can you guys? Yeah. So in terms of amendments, no. Once yes. the Torah is given, it can't change. Now, if Moses himself amends something in the Torah itself, rabbinic law, I guess most people don't understand this, existed even within the Torah because you had the Zakanim, what we consider the Sanhedrin nowadays, coming up with decisions uh, before the tent of meeting with Moses in the mix. And when they didn't know, they had to go to God. Okay. However, once a Torah was sealed for something to be considered Torah, right? It can't change. You can't add yes, to but it. Hashem, but, but, that, but, you're, but you're negating that Hashem gave that, that decree to state that, that, that only certain things were supposed to be given to the lineage to the sons. And then he amended that yeah. same Within Torah. the Torah. Yeah. But, yeah but, but that's what I'm saying. Yeah. After the Torah. Hold on, hold on. I'm saying the Torah is presenting itself that it, it was given... And you can't; it can be amended for an open-ended for a new uh, new covenant to be presented. So you could add to the Torah. Then we see, we see God doing that within the Torah. God did it Himself within the Torah. That's Asher's a distinction. Saying, hold on, Asher is saying like yeah. today you couldn't amend it, but because God amended it while He was already in the time of the Torah, then that's why. But yes, that's nonetheless, it. Nonetheless, Jeremiah thirty-one comes from Deuteronomy thirty. Otherwise, Jeremiah is a false prophet. He got the new covenant from Deuteronomy thirty. This was my point a few months ago when I told Asher, I said, within Jeremiah, it should have been stoned. Because if he's saying things that are untrue, wait, as a wait, prophet, wait, okay. then he never should have allowed. So I'll tell you right now. Because right, right. he did say that he's going to bring a new cut. He did okay. say that. He so said, first of all, we don't know that. Okay. So we don't wait, know. No, but did he say, he said, no we don't know. We can't validate any of the books of the prophets. Okay. They were written many times by memory. This is why. 
according to Jewish law, to write a Torah scroll, you have to copy it from another Torah scroll. To write a book of the prophets, you can do it from memory. It's there to give you an account of the life and times and the hyperbole and poetry and symbolism of that prophet. Not to any way create dogma and doctrine and religious ideas, which is essentially what Christianity is doing. Then he should have been stoned. No, I don't even believe he said that, by the way. Jeremiah didn't write the book of Jeremiah. Radar apologetics, please. Radar apologetics. That doesn't follow, though. I forgot my point. I guess it wasn't. It doesn't follow. Yeah, we forgot your point. <laughs> yeah, so it seems like it's a canned response there. So what, what in the Tanakh do you believe is valid? It's like you don't believe anything. I mean, I think this is the first time where you guys heard my show. Oh, yeah. It's not the first time for me. No, not you. You know. All right, so Courtney and Radar know me. You know, but I don't what think anyone else here does. What do we have for, like, Moses that in this case, if we're, we're going to apply that same stance, what do we have regarding like, Moses receiving um, the laws from God? On Mount Sinai. I mean, like, even if you look at any Egyptian, Egyptian because scriptures, it's the foundation of our faith. Don't even speak of, uh, We're just taking the Torah literally right now. Leaving the land. So you know, it's so like, it's interesting. All, all right, you know, so if you don't believe Muhammad is a prophet, then I mean, toss everything out as well. We're just oh, taking the Bible at its word. the The Torah yeah. specifically says, "Don't add or take away from it." Okay. Now, if someone adds to it and wants to call it rabbinic, it's something different. If you add to it and call it Torah, that's when the problem begins. So, Torah means instruction that you must keep under the you know under the authority of god if you're saying that hyperbole that appears in jeremiah could in some way redefine the purpose of being israel or calling yourself a purpose of god uh, like a person of god that's adding directly to the torah you can believe it but you expect other people to believe it that's where the problem begins all right radar go ahead radar rabbi eduardo you continue not in the covenant and he regarded you not so the issue was that he said finding fault with you because you guys were not keeping it that's literally yeah, what yeah. it says okay fine what's up everybody what's up rabino asher Woo! chicken nuggets in the house hey, what's up how you doing brother Good pop man. smoke i got pop smoke there just said chicken nuggets bro. chicken nuggets <laughs> inside joke all right all right so, so Asher, I got this, you know, where do you derive your premise for determining that the the Nach, the Nevi'im and the Ketuvim don't have authority like the Torah when Baruch Hofabe tells us that they were all given to Moses on Mount Sinai? And this isn't, and, and this isn't, this is there. So, all right. So how then do we, how do we differentiate? You make no that? distinction between a Midrash, right? Because I don't even think any rabbi alive walks around thinking that. You know, so you know that we don't take that Midrash literally. But so you're there, saying... There are plenty of Jews that think the Tanakh, the whole Nazi I've never, like heard, Sinai, right? I've, Yo, I've never know, met a Jew... A Jew think that? Okay, I've never met a Jewish person, I mean, okay. apart from yourself right now, who has ever made the claim that all of Tanakh was given to Mount Sinai. I mean, no, I, it's, not, it's not me. No, the writers of the Gemara. No, so correct. Like, I've never met a Jew like, who made that claim. To, but to, are there Jews that made that claim? I've, you're saying it right now. I mean, I've never I'm heard them say the it. Ta- the Talmud tells us. I mean, it's quite hard to say the when in the Talmud you have them arguing what books to include and what books to exclude. For example, Beit Shammai never accepted Megillus Esther. You know, so what Tanakh are you talking about? They weren't going to accept the, the book of Ezekiel. They weren't going to accept Kohelet. They weren't going to accept Shir So what Tanakh are you talking about? So, look, so this is what I'm saying. By the time of Berachot, in the year 500, 600. Ah, past that, that, by the way. I mean, it's Amorayim. This is what they're saying. But right, saying this, uh, right. so Amorayim. These are Jews authoritative. Not authoritative. Writing in that time period, right? Uh, okay, not, so, so the Berachot 5 is not authoritative. Amorayim are not authoritative. Not authoritative. Correct. Okay. Their job is to is, expound Halachot. Hold on. Yeah. The job of of Amarayim are to expound or explain the halachot brought down in the Mishnah or the Baraitot. That's the job of an Amara. So only because an Amara makes like an, an agadic statement like that, I don't think anyone will walk around thinking we must believe it, right? I mean... Okay, so you, you're just saying that you you, you agree that Baruch Hufabe says it was given a Mount Sinai. You just disagree with it. I'm not familiar with that statement. I'm not familiar okay. with any statement that says Tanakh. I mean, it says... Now, what does it say? Because you know, the word Tanakh doesn't yeah, exist in the Talmud. So Rabbi Levi Bar Chama said that Rabbi Shimon ben Lakish said, God said to Moses, ascend to me on the mountain, and I will give you the stone tablets to Torah the mitzvah that I've written that you may teach them. And then the Gemara goes on to say, the tablets are the Ten Commandments, Torah is the five books of Moses, the mitzvah is the Mishnah, that I've written refers to the prophets and writings, that you may teach them refers to the Talmud, 
This teaches that all were given to Moses from Sinai. So it's interesting, but the Rambam quotes that same thing, but he leaves out prophets and writings. Yeah, and 125 of his transmission of the Right, Lord. right. I mean, it's identical. But he adds the Tosefta, the Sifra, and the Sifra. He adds the Halachi Midrashim. No, he doesn't. Like, not in that. Yes, no, no, wait, wait. wait where? But look it up. It's in the first chapter, like, of Yusuf HaTorah. I have it right here. Give All me right. the big screen. I'll show you. No, read it, read it. Yeah, so this is the intent of both Talmuds is to elucidate the words of the mission. Oh, no, 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 no. Deeper point. That's now, not the I, statement. That's not no, the listen, statement. From the entire, listen, oh, no, 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 no. Wait, hold on. Yeah, but this is dishonest. No, wait, wait, no, hold on, hold on. No, no, let me finish the sentence because you asked me about the sentence. Two seconds. I'm yeah, but it's, two seconds. Go ahead, go ahead. It's not the right sentence. Okay. In the first chapter, it doesn't say that. In his introduction to Mishneh Torah, he, like, he lists all the sources of the oral law, which is something that's, different. That's right. So that's not like in the no, no, like no, first chapter of Mishneh Torah. I mean, I'll read it. I read to you. No. The yeah, but you have to. Dis okay. The, wait, wait, wait. Hold on. Well, you acknowledge that you're reading something else right now. I'm reading Mishnah Torah. Or no, Mishnah correct. Torah. Yeah, but they when the Rambam said. No. But when the Rambam says that the oral Torah is the parish, that's a different section. Right? No, that's not where I'm at. I said the Rambam so said the same right thing. Okay. I mean, you have to be honest right now. Okay, yeah, no, it's, it's, it's two different sections. Yeah, I acknowledge, yeah, hold on, I acknowledge that for sources of Torah Shabbat Peh, the Rambam says, the Sifra, the Sifri, the Mechilta, the Toseftot, and both Talmuds. 100% the Rambam says is somewhere else, okay? Somewhere else, the Rambam also says that the only source of oral law comes directly from the Sanhedrin. And this is the first chapter of the Hilchus Marmar. The same Rambam, okay? Yeah, he says they're the Iker of the Torah okay. Shabbat Peh. Correct. It, I mean, it yeah. means the source, essentially, the root of Torah Shabbat Peh. That means it either comes through or from the Sanhedrin. Okay. However, in the first, uh, in, in, I'm going to pull it up right now. But I believe it's the first halacha in, in Hilchus Yisudah Torah. He says that the mitzvah, uh, let me see, that the mitzvah or the mitzvot, no, but that the mitzvah, it says, it says, Zehu have perish, that it's, that Torah Shabbat Peh is a commentary um, translated from that verse. But, but we know that Torah Shabbat Peh is more than just commentary. No, look, I, got, I mean, I got it right here, what I'm saying. And I know you're agreeing with what I'm saying. He doesn't have the mechilta in this section. But no. He has a sifra and a sifra yeah, but you're picking two sifra. different sections and you're trying to combine them together. And I gave you three no, sections I, now I that contradict each other. Give me the big screen, I'll read it. It says exactly what I'm saying. No. I said that the Rambam says a similar thing, but quoting it verbatim. In the portion that was quoted verbatim, he left out the prophets and the writings. Okay. Yeah, he, okay he correct. Yeah, but this is a different writing. section you're reading. Do you acknowledge it's a different section you're reading? I don't know what section you're talking about. The section I'm bringing shows that it wasn't right. just the Talmud. You said it was only the Talmud. I'm saying it's the Tosaf, the no. Sifra, and the Sifra. That's what I'm saying. Wait, hold on. I'm going to pull it up. You know, because it, I mean, it seems like you're like bouncing around to try to make a point, but you're like a surgeon, you know, trying to I'm sew things one, together I'm that aren't together. I haven't gone anywhere. No, well, I'm I mean, it, I think it was dishonest for that when I said the Rambam quoted, you said, yeah, yeah, the Rambam quoted, and you were quoting a different Rambam, you know, because the Rambam that he quoted. No, I think, okay, I think, I mean, there's other people here. I think I was in the right, Okay, right. hold on one second. What do you mean? I mean, but I hold 5A, I mean, it's not a Mishra Torah, right? Hold on. Oh, what you think? Oh, I think Asher. Okay. Are you gonna speak now? Or... No, Asher. speak, speak, woman. <laughs> I think you need to like acknowledge that when you state that the Rambam left it out, right? That's for a purpose, right? You acknowledge? Yes. Who me? When he left out the full the yes, when he's talking about a specific place and he'll he'll host Malachim. Right is what is what we were looking at, where he leaves that portion out. Oh, you're reading. See here. No, hold on, hold on. I, I, yeah, I'm sorry. I mean, yes, I told me that I was going to pull it up. Hold on one second. Yeah, I know. <sighs> hmm. Let me see. Kol mitzvot shenitnu lo lemoshe b'sinai bepurshan benitnu. You know, so all the commandments that Moses received on Mount Sinai were given to him with its commentary. Shinamar, uh, let me see. I mean, I'm trying to find the actual verse. Here it says, okay. 
Okay. When it says Torah, it says Torah zo, Torah shibiktav. So when it says the word Torah, it's talking about Torah, what, so right. right. I mean the written Torah, and then it says yeah. mitzvah zo, perusha. That when it says the word mitzvah there, and we're reading, uh, this is Exodus twenty four twelve, that the mitzvah yeah. means the commentary, the perush, and it says. Uh, let me see. Where, where where you at? Well, this is in the introduction of Misha Torah, like the first paragraph or the second paragraph. Okay. So here it says that. Uh, uh, no, no, I mean, you're in the wrong one. Yeah. So here it says, U mitzvah zo he hanikra torah shabal peh. You know, so here it's saying that the mitzvah is what we call torah shabal peh. So it's telling us that the mitzvah is the perush, and the perush is torah shabal peh. So the perush. Next chapter? Uh, okay. I want to find that part. They say, U mitzvah torah shabal peh. It's. What's the torah shabal peh? It's. What's the Here, look. Well, I'm going to flip my camera around. Are you in uh are you in the I'm safari one? Because the safari breaks it down by verses, so I can see it better. Anikra Torah Shabal Pe. Uh huh. You know, so this is So this is when I said what that it was quoting verbatim. I'll just pull it up. Yeah. Now you're quoting another portion of of like of the introduction that that he's explaining all the sources he used to compile Mishneh Torah. Now, yeah, but that's but that's not what he's saying though, right? He's saying that this is given to Moses on Har Sinai, right? The Talmud, the Sifra, the Sifra. No, correct. But here, the Tosef, though. Here, like he's only calling Torah Shabbat Peh the interpretation to the mitzvah, but elsewhere he calls Torah Shabbat Peh everything that the Sanhedrin came up with, which is not essentially this. In terms of Takanas, Gezeras, Minhagam is the bulk of what the Sanhedrin came up with. And we call that Torah Shabbat Peh. Now that we're going to read the Megillah, we consider the Megillah part of Torah Shabbat Peh. In terms of reading the Megillah, the obligation to read the Megillah, part of Torah Shabbat Peh. But it's not anywhere in the Torah, nor is there a commentary that we extract it from. So you can't say that the Rambam agrees with this notion that the prophets and the writings were in some way given on Mount Sinai. I mean, it's it's. I never heard of the idea, right? But... I mean, there's some rabbis who believe that the teachings of the Lubavitcher Rebbe were also given in Har Sinai, right? And they're also wrong, in my opinion, you know, but it, it's a midrash and people have the right to have midrashic interpretations and devotional interpretations. But what they can't say is so matter of factly that Judaism teaches this. The sources of Judaism say that, right? So I got, I got another question. No, no, a source. A, no, no. Okay. This is only, this is only, yeah, it's this interesting is, that you use. This is only one of yeah. the many. Hold on. There's a lot though. Yeah, wait, wait, wait. Yeah. And, and wait, wait. We could go back and forth about it, but I, you know, it's cool. I mean, we could, you know, we could, I mean, we could hang Trust up. me, like, I'm very <laughs> honest, you know, to what's there. Uh, you're saying that sources teach that the whole Tanakh was given to Moses on Mount Sinai. I've never even heard this. It could be the, the prophets of the writings in terms of the prophecies, possibly of what the prophets may have said, not necessarily what appears in the books of the prophets. But there's a misconception that people have. Oh, not like, okay, okay. Wait, wait, wait. Hold on, hold on. You know, I mean, I remember when I was like debating Yitzhak Shapira, he was like, don't we have like part of the 13 principles to believe in the prophets? No, no, because he was trying to say that we have a command to believe in the books of the prophets. No, the command is to believe in prophecy, Stam. Yes, we have a, a commandment to believe in prophecy and more importantly, the prophecy of Moses, but not to validate the books in, in the prophets and Tanakh as divinely inspired. Anyways, on that note, I mean, I've been saying that I have to go for a while. You know, but uh, but it's nice to have Rabbi Royal up and uh, you know Rabbits and Courtney. But um, <laughs> anyways, so I have one more question though for you, Asher. Before you go, I don't know. I don't know your position on this, so I'm, I'm genuinely asking. 
do you believe that the Torah Shabbat Pei ever contradicts the Torah Shabbat Tav? Okay, so firstly, the Torah Shabbat Pei comes to explain the Shabbat Tav. Now, in regards to the Yako, statement... Yako, 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 I was still going to ask you, brother. I was still going to ask you. In regards to the statement you brought at the end... Asher, Shabbat why did you bring Yako Yako? Yako? You know what this does. Doesn't mean, this doesn't mean... Yeah, but who's Yako? Come on. I mean, Yako, I don't know who. Yako, Yako is, uh, you know, when we say chicken nugget, this is... Uh, Oh. One of the great gadolim of the chicken nugget. Chicken nugget. <laughs> okay, fine. Anyways, so um, I don't. I mean, I can't make such a definitive statement, you know, because some people view some things as halachas that aren't halachas. So I mean, even things that appear in the Mishnah that seem to contradict each other. So like, I mean, can it? For sure, it can. I mean, there's a whole masechet in the Talmud called masechet um, horayot that deals with the errors of the Sanhedrin. So can it contradict? For sure, it could contradict. Hopefully, it's caught in time, and then you bring a korban to to. To fix any mistake that you brought up that's it because you know there's there's something that i i think is an issue for rabbin judaism and i'm generally interested in your thoughts on this you know the rambam in his in his perush to the mishnah mm. he brings down this um deuteronomy 25 11 and 12 where he tells that false prophecy is even breaking the uh accepted tradition of interpretation of a passage so essentially when you cut a woman's hand off the Torah tells us cut the woman's hat off, hand off, right? Yeah. yeah. Well, Rambam says anyone who says it this way is a false prophet. Yeah. I'm not trying to challenge you. I'm genuinely. No, I get it. Think about this. Well, so the reason that the Rambam's parish Mishnayot is not so popular is because all he's doing is commenting on statements in the Mishnah, unlike Mishnah Torah, where he's actually telling you what the actual halach is. So it it doesn't matter like if he's just explaining to you a statement in the Mishnah. It doesn't. I mean, it could be that we don't even hold by that statement. So. um I don't, I don't have a response to that. I mean, only because the Rambam... I mean, the Rambam also, also wrote a commentary to the Torah that was lost. And a whole yeah. commentary to the Gemara. We only have uh, like Masechet, uh, like Rosh Hashanah of the Rambam on, yeah. like, on the Gemara. So I don't have an answer to that. I was just, I was curious, I was just curious about it. I was reading the introduction to it, and I thought it was really interesting that he even considered that false prophecy to break with the... Even if it's the literal interpretation of the text, right? The, the well, false prophecy from what extent? False prophecy. With that the person exactly. has to be unalived? I mean, uh, yeah, so no, it, the idea is that the woman's hands have to be detached, right? Because so she grabs the male genitals. But he says, no, 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 this you just find her. And anyone who says you have to actually cut her hands off, they should be stoned because they're a mm -hmm. false prophet. Yeah. I mean, I'm not familiar with it. I mean, it sounds interesting to me. I mean, like, I'll check it. Uh, like, I'll check into it. There's two different types of false, pro like, uh, false prophets, it's in, by the way. Chapter two on prophecy. So, oh, all right. So it's in the introduction then. All right. I mean, it's not in the in actual the person mission yet. Yeah, yeah, introduction. Uh, yeah, because he has a whole thing on prophecy there. But um, it's, it's, it's fascinating the stuff he says. And I think a lot of modern Jews will be shocked by some of the things he says in there, right? So, it'll catch them off guard. but there's two types of false prophecy. But there's a, there's a prophecy that once he's been hailed by a prophet, supposedly by the Sanhedrin. And then, I mean, someone just claiming to be a prophet and gives over inaccurate information. Uh, with the idea that only because someone says God, you know, is telling me to tell you this and he gives you incorrect information, that person you don't stone. But someone who in some way is is officially speaking under the auspices of the court, like meaning that the Sanhedrin validates him as a prophet. So his words come to be almost an extension of the authority of the Sanhedrin that in some way that that prophet gets like gets unalived. Um, but that's a more complex thing that, that it's not fully thought out, but it's just, you know, cause people think like, well, then Jeremiah is a false prophet cause he wrote this. Well, it appears like that in the book. Like, I don't know, like if I was, there's some prophets that were never declared prophets by the Sanhedrin. For example, Jeremiah, you know I mean? Jeremiah was rejected by the Sanhedrin and was only seen to be a true prophet. Once the prophecy came true that, that Babylon invaded Israel and, and like, and took them as captives, you know? So anyways, guys, I gotta go because you know, I have to go run. Uh, thank you, thank you, thank you, Rabbi Arroyo. You know, let's do it Good again. To see you, sir. You know, Miss Courtney, the, the the queen of debates. Thank you. And Bree. Yeah. Bree. <laughs> and we're going to get Bree married, all right? Bree, huh? I'm going to get you married. If it's Rudy. Okay, Rudy Rachman. <laughs> you know, Bree is looking no, for you. Rudy Giuliani. Rudy Giuliani. All right, take it easy, bye. All right, guys. Yeah. Sorry, sorry, sorry.